Okay, well, I think we should get started. Um, so the first thing is, well, I'm gonna call this meeting to order. Um, the first thing is to review and approve the agenda. Um, and I don't, oh, yes, John. <laughs> Hi, um, so I've got, it's it's liquor license season again, so you'll, <laughs> for real, you'll start seeing that on the agenda every time starting next time, but I do have one that I told the folks I would try to get on today, but it was after the agenda went out. It's for a first, second, and third glass license for the folks who are, you probably read about them in the paper, dropping in at Kismet, uh, Oaks and, uh, oh shoot, Oaks and Evelyn. Um, so I would, I would respectfully <clears throat> ask that um, you all consider granting them a, a, a the city's approval for a first, second, and third class alcohol license that I can then forward to the, the DLC. And I understand they've done everything right as far as the DLC is concerned. Okay. Just an add to the consent agenda, I guess. There's no objections. Okay. So I have one item. I'm not sure if it's really a formal agenda add, but we need to take our photo for the annual report. So Jane has asked if at the end of the meeting, if the council members and Cameron and John Odom and I can just be on and get a screenshot of us on the on the screen. You know, I usually hide from those things. <laughs> well, there was one that I appeared in. Well, you're, you can do as you wish, but the rest of us. Need to. I think we should have two, one with mask on, one with mask off. Oh, there you go. Symbolize the year. <laughs> oh, so um, should we talk about that? Call would pretty much symbolize yeah. the year. Yeah, that's accurate. Um, maybe this is something we can discuss further at the end. Is that okay? We can throw that on. I just want to make sure I mention like, that. Yeah, uh, we'll do that after the, the warning. Um, yeah, anything no, else? At the end of the meeting, assuming we're all still here. <laughs> Honor, you're going to have to comb your hair. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so um, with that, we'll consider the uh, agenda approved with those um, additions. So the next thing is general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on any topic that is otherwise not on our agenda. Um, if you have comments about something on the agenda, um, hold off, we're, we'll allow you to, to speak uh, adjacent to that topic. Um, but if there's some topic that is not on our, agen our agenda that you'd like to talk with us about, um, now would be the time to do it. And as with um, all uh, public comment, if you could uh, state your name and where you live and, um, Try to keep your comments to two minutes. That would be fabulous. Um, all right, anyone uh, want to address the council? Uh, please uh, either use the raise hand function or physically raise your hand or hit a reaction button on the Zoom. How about if you're on a flip phone? <clears throat> you just speak up. Would you like to if say I'm something? If I'm the only one, I'll wait. Other, yeah, I would, but uh, I was letting anybody else go first. Uh, okay. I visited the I visited the uh, transit center this week, and seven people uh, occupying the building. There's not a not a chair, a couch, or uh, anything. Fiberglass, whatever. No staff. Uh, bathrooms are locked. Bathrooms say ask for assistance but then you research further and read the fine print nobody even there from 11 to 2 30 and you go to shaw's padlock on the restroom uh you go to kellogg Hubbard library closed except for grabbing your book uh city hall bathroom public building we own it and y'all are locking it to protect your family you know it's it's, I've said it again, and I won't stop saying it. You're callous, you're, you know, indifferent, you're oblivious, you're, you're really ignoring. People are supposed to be washing their hands six or eight times a day. People are, need to relieve themselves instead of, in, you know, it's just, it's outrageous that we've got that building and that, those new bathrooms, and we, 
can't seem to manage ourselves into arranging for some public bathrooms to be open. Um, thank you. <clears throat> okay. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I think we did get word that there was a new um, portalette that was put in somewhere. Cameron, where was that? Go so use it yourself. Oh, I, I have used portalettes on many occasions. Anyway, go ahead, Cameron. Um, it's behind the State Visitor Center, um, right across the street from the State Capitol. It's in the park okay. behind the building. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, anyone else? Okay. Uh, all right, so on to the consent agenda. Is there a motion? Uh, Jack, go ahead. Move the consent agenda. Second. second. Okay, there's a motion and a second. And um, any further discussion? Uh, Jack. I am uh, going to be voting in favor of the consent agenda, but I think it's uh, worth us recognizing that uh, as we move the uh, <clears throat> location of the uh, Girton Pocket Park, uh, we, uh, I, I think there are, it's fine to do that, but I, I think we need to recognize that this still is leaving an uh, unfilled um, <clears throat> need that we need to continue to work on addressing so that the, uh, the people who have been uh, relying on that location for uh, for a place to uh, socialize and congregate, still need their needs met in uh, in the city. Yes, thank you, uh, Donna. Uh, thank you, Jack, for starting that off because I too wanted to bring this one up. I felt disappointed that it was within the consent agenda. I think it deserved a little bit of discussion. Uh, there was <clears throat> the matter of the actual grant which kudos to the staff going after this grant it has a wonderful description here of all the things they want to do around moving this pocket park so i i really salute that effort and i hope people you know help us all reach those goals and i presume also that is passing this resolution that's attached or is that separate on the agenda is uh, that would be included in that consent agenda um I, okay it, if y'all are interested in pulling it, I can certainly give a presentation on it. That's not a problem. Well, I just want to read parts of it. Uh, the actual resolution that the mayor is being asked to sign that goes with this consent agenda talks about adding public art, public seating, seasonal activities in partnership, and a pump track. <laughs> so that could become a real lively spot, and that's very inspiring. So. Um, again, Cameron, if you were the one clever here, or Ann, or, or Paige, or Bail, whoever, but kudos, thank you very much. But like Jack said, we also then need to come back to what, how are we going to help people who need our assistance that have been using this space. So let's don't forget that. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Connor. Now, I, just, I just wanted to thank staff. I was on the previous meeting there, just going over. Um, some of the blueprints there, and there's a tremendous amount of creativity factored into this. And uh, I, I think staff did recognize that it's a pretty short turnaround of the grant. So it's not like a solid decision, but we're probably not going to determine whether we want commercial space or residential or anything anytime in the near future. So using this space as a place where, you know, we can open up Montpelier when the sun comes out, you know, people can go have a sandwich there. That's a beautiful thing. So um, I, I think this is an example of just thinking outside the box, the kind of stuff we need to be doing going forward. So thanks very much to everybody who worked on it. Yeah, thank you. Any further comments? And we certainly can pull that one off if you would prefer, but um, if not, that's I okay. would ask that it be pulled off. And I'm not a council member, but I, I didn't see that. Uh, it didn't mention Garden Pocket Park. It didn't mention anything in the consent agenda. And I protest the fact that you you removed us from C E C fiber in a consent agenda item as well. It's inappropriate. 
So it's up to the uh, council. Um, is so there was a motion and a second. Um, any one want to amend that? Uh, Jack, I, I think there's enough interest here that it's worth taking the <clears throat> this item out of the consent agenda. So I uh, move to amend my motion to uh, to do that. Okay. Is there a second on the amendment? Second that. Okay. So there's a motion and a second on the amendment. Um, uh, any further discussion on the amendment? Okay. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? Okay, so the motion has been amended. So it's back to um, a motion and a second. Any further discussion on the consent agenda minus that item? Okay, um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, and opposed? Okay, so uh, as the um, primary item for well so the question is do we do that right now or do we um do that later and i suspect that most people are probably here for the budget hearing so um i think we should probably do that next and then um so after item six we will take up um item c from the consent agenda um about this grant and uh, which does involve the Girton Park Park. Uh, all right, so, um, all right, so moving on then to uh, the budget hearing. Um, so for this, I think um, the just the order of operations of what's going to happen here uh, is that uh, Bill's got a presentation, um, or maybe Kelly, <laughs> one of the two, uh, and then um, and then I'd like to specifically hear from the public um, and then um, we'll uh, go from there. Uh, so Bill or Kelly. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna do a quick, um, let me just see if I can find what I'm looking for here. Um, ah. Hold on, I'm trying to, I'm gonna share my screen as soon as I can figure out what I'm looking for here. As soon as I can find it. Um, how do I search? Does someone want to tell me how to search? <laughs> oh, come on. Control F usually if you're in a PDF. Control F. Well, I'm looking to get to my desktop is what I'm trying to do. Um, figure out what to share. Uh, usually these files are right there. Um, I am terribly sorry about this. I'm obviously not good at this. Uh, files. Is there a search space at the bottom of your screen to the left? I'm looking for here. Yeah. A, excuse me, a search place at the bottom of the screen? To the left? No. Okay. Do you have a PC? I do. So to get to your desktop, there's a tiny little bar on the very bottom far right hand side that you can click on that takes you straight to the desktop, in theory. I think I'm getting rescued by Kelly. <laughs> okay. Yay, Kelly. Hey there. Let's use that to... Let's see. You can get a lot open here, Bill. I know. There it is. It's this one right here. All right. Can folks see that? Uh, no, not yet. Not yet. Kelly is not sharing his screen. I'm going to start. For some reason. Can you see it now? Nope. Nope. 
I know. Huh, interesting. Screen share. The other time I've done it, it pops up in that group. There you go. All right. There you go. An hour in business. Yay. Get up here. Okay. All right. Thank you, Kelly. You're welcome. Well, I apologize for that. It'll probably take longer to have done that to actually go through the presentation. Um, it's just a quick overview of what we've been talking about the last few months. This is the first public hearing of the city council of our budget. There's another one next Thursday before final decisions are made. Um, so this is where the council is at right now. As we did the FY22 budget, uh, we had some challenges. We had a major budget gap due to COVID-19. Our goals were to deliver responsible services, implement our strategic plan. Um, and then we based our budgeting on a one year COVID-19 horizon thinking that by July 1 of 2021, when we are doing, when the next budget would be, uh, things should be more back to, um, should be back to whatever the new normal will be. And we did understand that residents and businesses have been hit by COVID, and so therefore we had to be very careful with any tax increase. The strategic plan priorities of the City Council are community prosperity, COVID-19 response, of course, environmental stewardship, more housing, responsible and responsive government, and sustainable infrastructure. So looking at our budget revenue, we projected a general fund gap of about $520,000 from various revenues, and those are all detailed in the books. And the parking fund, uh, another $525,000 of which, and these are, um, this is specifically parking money that uh, has offset various expenses like police dispatch, various admin staff, um, which is now no longer available. So those expenses needed to be picked up by the general fund, even though they aren't new expenses. So total budget gap of about a million dollars, or revenue gap, excuse me. And then another close to 400. So what we had um, on top of a COVID crisis, we had a rare once every 12 years, 27th pay period, which pushed all of our personnel costs up uh, in every line. Um, we also finally uh, we had to adjust our legal for our costs and put money into a reserve for a reappraisal. So that created about $400,000 in expense pressure on the budget. Um, it, and the 20, I want to be clear, the 27th pay period wasn't just, um, well, that 330,000 wasn't just that. It was a contributing factor. It also included normal steps, um, cost of living adjustment, which we did not do in the current fiscal year. So the combination, uh, so um, in, to try to close that $1.4 million gap, we have the following reductions. There are six positions that are being left vacant, one police officer, one finance staff person, two within recreation and two within DPW. We reduced our capital and equipment plan by close to 475,000. Uh, we have some external and community funding dropped by about 216,000. Our operations were dropped by 20, 110,000 and uh, we had two ballot items last year that were 23,500 each, and one of them is not here this year. So a net drop of 23.5 for a total of about $1.2 million in spending reductions to, to close that million dollar uh, revenue gap. So currently where we ended up in the budget is a property tax increase of 0.6%, uh, 0.7, and that includes funding for Montpelier Alive, it includes funding for uh, the equity consultant that's doing work in the community. It includes funding for the Montpelier Energy, um, Energy, not, what, what is the A? <laughs> advisory, Energy Advisory. advisory. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> advisory Committee. Uh, the Police Department Social Worker, the ballot item for the library, the ballot item for Central Vermont Home Health uh, and Hospice the personnel cost reallocations, and that's what I just talked about, um, covering the costs of formerly, items that had formerly been allocated to the per, uh, parking fund, now reallocated to the uh, general fund. And there's been some questions about that with regard to police and dispatch, because people saw increases in those budgets, but it was simply where they were being paid from. Uh, and then our basic services continued. 
some key budget items that uh, remained. Uh, in the current fiscal year, we adjusted our budget down to deal with the projected shortfall. So what you're seeing on the column to the left is the, is the adjusted amounts for these things. And then the FY22 column is what we budgeted for next year. So the community fund has remained whole at 131,050. Housing trust fund, 60,000 dropped to 50,000. The Montpelier De Development Corps dropped from 75,000 to zero. Homelessness task force actually increased from 22,500 to 45,000. Public arts fund dropped from 10 to zero and the capital area neighborhoods, which had not been in last year's budget were added in at 20,000. So approximately a $50,000 drop um, from the adjusted amounts the original amounts for those were, were much higher, about 490,000 for all of those in the original FY21 budget. So taking a look at some key budget numbers, the general fund budget overall is reduced by $372,000, about two and a half percent. And it requires only $61,322 of new tax dollars, as I said, 0.6%. There are no changes to the water, sewer and CSO benefit charges. Uh, so the average home, which is assessed at $228,000 single family home, will see a six, would see a $16 tax increase for this. Uh, in comparison, um, the Northeast 12 month CPI just came out uh, either yesterday or today, and it was 1.4% for the last 12 years. So the count, we've always tried to keep our tax rate uh, around uh, CPI, and this year it's about half of CPI. Um, Talking about, since it's a public hearing, we did uh, for the first time in a while, a, a citizen um, budget survey online uh, and the results are now posted. We're gonna go through those quickly. We did get 320 responses. Question number four was an open-ended question. Uh, so we're compiling those narrative results, sorting them by category, and we'll get you all of those by the end of the week so you have them before next weekend. But in terms of the questions that were asked, but 95% of the residents, uh, of the respondents, excuse me, were Montpelier residents. Um, and they found that public works, public safety, uh, police and public safety fire were their top three categories, uh, parks and housing uh, right below those and then environment energy. So this is where people felt were the most important services and asking if they would support uh, increasing taxes to to support the city's revenues to continue service levels. Uh, about 30% said they would support, about 32%, 33% were neutral, but 38% would not prefer that. So pretty even split there um, on that. So those were the three questions. And then the fourth uh, uh, open-ended question, which as I said, uh, those are all over the map and we will get you all of those. You will be able to see every response. So that is um, all I have for presentation. We're certainly uh, able to answer his questions, our staff's here, um, just to go through the schedule. Again, we have the public hearing tonight, next Thursday. And again, I, I note to everyone that it is a Thursday to, in order to meet the 40 day uh, requirement for town meeting. That is our one a year on Thursday, second public hearing. In February, we will start talking about our utility budgets, uh, water and sewer. District heat, those are not on the ballot, so we will do those later. And of course, on March 2nd is voting, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., early voting to start mid-February, and at some point, I'm sure the city clerk will talk about all the various options with that. So that's a quick summary of the budget that the council has put together and is preparing. Uh, and as I said, we're happy to enter discussions or answer any questions as we go forward. And again, sorry about the technological glitch there at the beginning. No worries. Okay, uh, Donna, do you have a question? I, I was just curious, how did people find out about the survey? Somehow I missed that you were doing it. Um, well, I'm sorry you missed it. I think we did maybe put that in the weekly memo or send it to you all. It was on the website. We put it in front porch forum. We had it uh, on Facebook. Uh, Kelly, can you think of any other place? We, you know, we tried to put it in all the usual places. Yeah, that's right. I mean, and we, you know, this year we really wanted to do something to engage the public and wanted to do it sort of, you know, um, do an electronic survey. And so this is kind of a soft start for future years. 
Um, but my apologies well, if, you know, you didn't. No, no, it's great. I'm great. And, you know, I don't know. You, you said 320 comments. I don't know how many responded, but that sounds like a good, you know, that sounds good. Yeah, I, I'm quite pleased with, you know, the number of responses. And I've been working through each and every fourth question response, which is more of a narrative. And there's been some really good feedback. Um, and good. so, you know, I'm looking forward to being able to share that too. Yeah, great. No, really good. Thank you. Thank you. Great. All right. So at this point, uh, we'd love to hear from the public. So um, in order to uh, to do this, I have um, I get the sense that there might be a few folks who would like to speak. Um, so if you would like to um, if you would like to speak, if you could indicate um, that by either uh, raising your the the hand in the um actually i'll let cameron you you explain it <laughs> thank you mayor you can either under where you are in your participant you can raise a hand you can also hit the reaction button give a little clap emoji you can also literally wave at me and i will write your name down great and so just um from folks who have all right, okay, so I'm seeing um, Mara and Stella. Can, I've and, got a verbal request to get in the queue. Okay, um, I'm gonna write down, I'm writing down Mara and Stella and then Abby German. Rachel, and I'm so sorry y'all, I will be pronouncing your names phonetically and I will probably butcher them. So, Giselitz is raising her. Okay. okay. And anyone after that you have after Rachel, uh, Cameron? Stephen Whitaker. Not at this point. Uh, Lucy's iPhone. Okay, so Stephen Whitaker is after Rachel. And then Lynn. I'm sorry, after Stephen, I'm, I'm missing one. After Stephen was Lucy. Lucy, okay. And then Flynn. Okay. Then Stephanie. And I'm sorry, your name is cut off. It starts with G O N. Oh, yes, Stephanie Gomery. Okay. Um, okay, and there may be others, and that is fine. Well, that's, that's our starting list for now, and we'll, we'll go from there. Um, <clears throat> all right. Uh, Mara and Stella, if you would uh, introduce yourselves, and then, uh, yeah, then go ahead. Thank you. I'm Mara Stevens and I'm Stella Khan. And uh, we stand in solidarity with Surge, Defund, MPD, and community leaders to call for the Montpelier City Council to defund MPD and invest in community based safety measures. A 2018 study from the FBI revealed that over 95%, over 95 of crimes committed in Montpelier were nonviolent crimes of necessity, uh, such as theft. Uh, the police cannot address the underlying causes of or prevent these crimes, but only respond after an incident has occurred. Investing in community services, such as affordable housing, food security measures, and et cetera, will reduce the desperation that causes these crimes, thereby improving actual public safety and well being. The current police budget of $3 million per year is far more than is necessary to respond to the average of. 15 annual calls for dangerous crimes in Montpelier. We suggest a decrease of 10% from the current Montpelier budget, Montpelier police budget of $3 million. For the $12 million budget of the Montpelier Roxbury School District, we employ about 250 full time employees, meaning that for $1 million, we can employ 21 teachers, but only five police officers. This is an absurd and harmful waste of public money. Montpelier City Council has a commitment to helping the Montpelier community and defunding the Montpelier Police Department for the immediate and long-term well-being of our community is a necessary step. The Montpelier Police Department's bloated budget overcompensates for minor crimes that need to be addressed in a real and provable way while unnecessarily wasting our taxpayer dollars in a man manner that is harmful to our community. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Abby. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Beautiful. Um, so my name is Abby German. My pronouns are they, them. Uh, and looking at our current proposed budget for the city of Montpelier, mm -hmm. I am deeply appalled, but not surprised to see that the police are set to receive a 10.4% increase, bringing this to 22.9% of our total city budget. This indicates either incredible ignorance or willful indifference in regards to the national movement for black lives, neither of which make me confident in or proud of my city leadership. This summer, following the police murder of George Floyd, the city of Montpelier painted Black Lives Matter outside mm -hmm. of our Capitol building. Without committed action, this is simply performative allyship. This condemnation of racism without specifically re-examining the police risks nothing and means nothing. Black Lives Matter is not a catchy slogan to absolve your white guilt. It is a commitment to change our racist institutions, including policing. The police is a violent, anti-Black, colonial institution that originated as slave patrols. Their primary mandate is to protect not citizens, but property, and to militarily enforce white supremacist capitalism. I see a lot of white exceptionalism in our community here, as if our police are somehow better than police in other areas, but this is simply not true. When it comes to the national crisis in policing, Vermont is not an outlier. Black people are stopped and searched at disproportionate rates to white people. Our prisons have some of the worst racial disparities in the entire United States, and images of police brutality against people of color appear often, and the officers are not held accountable. This is despicable, and we must do everything in our power to stop this oppression and violence. It is my view that the police must be completely abolished, but as a means to an end, we must defund the police. Possible solutions to social problems, excluding police and prisons include, but are not limited to, affordable housing, healthcare, employment, counseling, after-school programs, trauma services, and anti-violence programs. So, this 10% increase should go into that, not into the police. In 1777, Vermont proved itself to be on the right side of history when it became the first state to abolish slavery. Systemic racism, unfortunately, was not abolished and is upheld in many of our institutions, including law enforcement. Now, in 2021, it is time for Vermont to prove itself to be on the right side of history yet again. It is time to take a stand against the prison industrial complex, the police and their racist and violence practices. We have to defund the frickin' police. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Um, so I also just wanna note that um, I, um, I wanna hear from everyone first and then we may uh, address um, some of the things that you're you're talking about um, at at the end. Um, so um, I just wanted to make sure that I I said that. Um, all right. Uh, so next up is uh, Rachel Desolets. Uh Thank you for uh, this forum and allowing residents an opportunity to express their thoughts regarding the budget. I have two questions. One, uh, the first one has to do with property taxes and the second one has to do with personnel uh, issues. Um, so uh, my, the question around property taxes refers to unpaid property taxes. Uh, and I'm not referring to the 2020 in which, you know, we've been living through this pandemic but more specifically pre-pandemic, that how does uncollected taxes, which is a liability, get treated? And then when you collect the taxes that are unpaid, how do they get treated? You know, that becomes an income and is that a separate line item in the budget? Um, so that's, the first issue around taxes. The second one is around is three part, and it has to do with personnel. And 
my understanding um, is that under the public works line item, we are holding one engineer position and one street position vacant. Um, of great concern to me is the one street position. And especially given all the water main breaks that were incurred last year. So I'm very concerned about that position not being filled. Um, under the community, the second personnel issue under community service, um, there are two rec department positions being held vacant. And my end, when I looked at the school budget, the school has added one full time position to their budget to take care of the grounds that was the responsibility of the rec department. Again, this I didn't work the budget. That's just my understanding from reading it. So I, I may be off. Uh, so my question is, why are we holding two rec department positions? vacant when the school has added one of those positions into their budget. Um, and then my last personnel uh, question has to do with the police department. Um, one position, again, my understanding is that one position is held open. And the school, I think, eliminated the SRO position from their budget, leaving a half-time police position open. Is there any way we can use that half position to fund uh, and add it to the grant that funds the social worker so that we can have one and a half-time social worker? position because positions because I'm concerned about having one position that's supposed to address all the issues uh, between two schools and I know this is a beginning but even as a beginning it just doesn't make sense so even though I'm looking at adding a half it's a little bit more uh, but it isn't where it needs to be so those are my points, my questions. Great, thank you. And again, let, we'll, um, we're making notes, by the way, <laughs> of all these things. Um, okay, uh, Stephen Whitaker. Um, Stephen. If you'd like to go, now would be a good time. Or we can come back to you. Is it my turn? Yep, yep it is. Okay, yeah, I was uh, had a senator doing call waiting. Okay, so uh, while I don't want to um, trivialize or diminish uh, the, some of the, the couple of the prior, I appreciate the immediately prior mentioning the public works budget uh, the pr prior before that mentioning the police uh, realistically I'm gonna I've asked today to be on the agenda and take up many of my issues with the police uh, scope and cost in the context of that police review commission which you've created so I won't belabor that point um, nor will I align with my with the idea that we should just abolish it completely on that note though if indeed the reason we need a three million dollar police department, or even a million and a half dollar police department, is because our uh, situation as the state capital. It's entirely reasonable to uh, prevail upon the state legislature to bear uh, a significant piece of that cost as payment in lieu of taxes, because uh, we do not need to. If if people are going to converge next week on the state capitol and we need a, a bigger department the state should pay for that or supply that we don't need an oversized department to drive around in circles you know chasing cats and you know lost wallets uh we, that that's doesn't require a three million dollar police department 
Uh, secondly, I want to speak to the public, the uh, public safety dispatch budget. Uh, I mentioned it in a prior meeting in the public comment period. I have done further research, and I have evidence that a Motorola uh, representative spoke to a public safety authority uh, in Illinois and said, yes, we're sunsetting these consoles, we're, we're uh, discontinuing these consoles, but here's the few parts to buy, and you can get five more years' life out of those consoles. So the idea that we need immediate $135,000 a year for the next three years, three or $400,000 worth of consoles, is a lie. You are being lied to by your police department staff with no, there's no name or date on the report, the only document justifying that ask, um, my request for public records has been delayed due to, our, I'm sure Bill will own that. Um, but the purchase of consoles starting this in this year's budget for $135,000 is premature, especially in light of the needs assessment, professional independent engineering needs assessment being conducted by CVPSA. It's entirely possible that Montpelier will not uh, continue to maintain its $345,000 revenue, that a regional system will evolve, and Montpelier will take its rightful and humble role in that. Um, but manipulating the process, hiding the records, buying things prematurely is not the way to do that and build trust that's necessary for that regional system to evolve. Um, I recommend that we consider uh, we are in emergency times. We cannot count on huge, you know, backfill from federal money. Um, at the end of current contracts, I suggest that we consider uh, recruiting a new city manager um, with a cap of $100,000, not 130000 and make one of the qualifying attributes for that city manager a strong background in public works. We've got decades of neglected public works to catch up on, and having a, an engineering background, as Barry does, um, would help us and help our public works department uh, grow to the task. That's, uh, so I would eliminate the assistant city manager and rely on one city manager with one assistant to keep minutes of meetings and schedules, et cetera. We've got way too much bloat of ineffective uh, and uh, unnecessary uh, staffing. And I know you all consider it all family, but that's not what the public can afford. Um, I think I think that uh, I will address the other issues and bring them back. I think we you have two public hearings, and I I will I'm, I've asked Lauren to put me on the agenda for the the next police review commission. I'd like to have them uh, refine and filter my suggestions and history with that department, but we are grossly overpaying for a $3 million police department when we really need about half that. And we need, you know, if we can't get simple public restrooms after a year and a half of badgering from somebody as persistent as I, we really need to question the effectiveness of our staff. Um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. All right, Lucy. Um, is the, I'm trying to see if Lucy is still on. I don't see. I've asked her to unmute. Hi, hi, can you hear me? Oh, yes, yes, now we can. Thank you. Okay, hi. Um, I am also calling to disagree with the increase of the police budget. Um, if the city wants to de decrease or prevent our very already um, pretty low crime rate, studies show that investing in community programs is the most effective action rather than investing in the police. 
Um, so there's really no reason why the police are due to get a 10% e increase while quote unquote community programs are slashed by nearly 50%. Um, in this deadly pandemic, I'm sure we can agree that medical professionals, educators, and people working and living at the elderly and assisted living facilities are the most at risk and therefore um, the most uh, in need of these extra funds. But these programs are also proposed to be downsized. Um, and I really appreciate the first speakers who provided specific research and solutions to reinvesting that money in education specifically. Um, I think the city of Montpelier needs to take um, a long look at our uh, priorities right now and ask ourselves why we are trying to decrease um, or defund the programs that we really need at this time. Um, and I think we should follow the footsteps of our fellow Vermont cities, Rutland and Burlington and defund and disarm the police rather than increase their funding. That's it. Okay. Thank you. Can I get your last name, Lucy? I'm sorry. Am I still on? Yes. It's German. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yep. Okay. Um, Flynn. Mm -hmm. And now it's Flynn all good. Hello. Hello, Flynn. Hi, sorry. <laughs> uh, my name is Flynn. Um, I use uh, he, him pronouns, and I live in uh, District 1. Um, I apologize, I'm a little unprepared, but um, I just wanted to um, echo what the other folks have been saying tonight and show um, my support for the immediate defunding of the Montpelier Police Department by um, you know, at least the 10% that's proposed for the 2022 budget. Um, yeah, having grown up here in Montpelier and um, having been raised on this false idea that somehow you know, we are exempt from the violence and racism that um, plagues the rest of the country um, and US policing in general. Um, I want so badly to be proud of being from here, uh, but with this proposed 10.4 increase, I believe, um, that's just not even possible. It's time to stop like simply saying that we're a safe and progressive community and that our police are you know, somehow different. Um, and instead it's time to start taking actionable steps towards becoming that community. Um, and defunding the MPD is just um, you know, the very beginning. Um, I also just wanted to thank and acknowledge the speakers um, before me as um, I, I heard a lot of them um, outlined other possible areas where um, that uh, funding could be uh, diverted and invested in for actual ways to um, increase public safety. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, Stephanie. Hi, um, I guess I can show my face. Why not? Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, so yeah, I too want to echo my disappointment in the increase in police funding in this year of all years. I mean, so many people here in Montpelier, so many people nationwide and worldwide have been voicing their desire to decrease funding for the police. And here we're seeing MPD getting an increase. And I mean, as a former PR professional, I can assure you that in addition to being awful for our community, it's really bad for Montpelier's image. I mean, this year of all years, I mean, a previous speaker mentioned the Black Lives Matter mural. And I remember when that happened, I and many others said, we're really worried that this, you know, which is a great act of art and of, of all that, we're worried that this might just be a box to check and it might be an empty gesture. I was certain it would be, and now I'm, that's confirmed. And, you know, seeing it like screenshotted in um, the budget proposal today made my stomach turn because it's, if we're going to not only not defund the police, but increase by so much and so much since last year and the year before, when you see that, that chart in the budget, it, it is stomach turning. And it shows you haven't been listening to, to any of the community, not the people who come here to talk or email you, but you know, what about all the articles all of us have read in the past year and, and all the pundits we've listened to on TV and all the, all the evidence we've heard about how bad policing is for communities and, and all the protests we've seen. It makes it seem like, Either you weren't listening or you did listen and you reflected and you thought and you conversed with your family and friends. And then you were like, I don't care that much. The status quo is more important. Or in this case, not the status quo, but an increased budget for the police. If anything, you couldn't have said like, they've got what they need, let's, let's keep it at that. That's, what, that's what's really galling. And I mean, 
it's not just here. In Burlington, BPD used force against Black people this year at a record rate in 2020. So in 2020, when you know Vermont and the nation have, have risen up to demand better, Black individuals in Burlington have gotten the worst police treatment ever. So I guess I'm not surprised that in a year you painted the Black Lives Matter mural, you've also increased the police budget. And my last thing I'll say is, you know, to address the exceptionalism that other people talked about, it, lest you think Burlington is a different beast, I don't think Montpelier is far off at all. It just so happens that we, unlike Burlington, don't have concentrated communities of people living in poverty or concentrated communities of people of color. But if we did, I think our police problem would be a lot like Burlington's and it, it, might not, it might even be worse. This is just common sense. You know what happened deep down, you just know it. I don't want that to happen here. Um, as others have said, Montpelier residents are suffering from the pandemic and it just, I would have liked to see a little more imaginative thinking around how to allocate funds to programs that really would benefit people at this exact moment in time. I mean, that could be like fully funding the housing trust fund, which is less than half funded, I believe, um, allocating more funding to public works even just to keep our city running the way we needed to, funding community and arts fund, Obviously there are so many other things, but it's, it's a slap in the face to all of us to see this hypocrisy and to see this, this, this large increase in a year when people are suffering and in a year when we've been trying to make this point. And I don't know if it's like a simple backlash, like people rise up and then the powers that be kind of, you know, get scared and, and, and respond with the opposite. I don't know what it is politically. I haven't, I don't know, but it's just, it's deeply disappointing. And I expect more from Montpelier. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right, Meredith. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm here to object to the budget increases that are proposed for the Montpelier Police Department. Um, our city government and community need to be focused on public safety but police are not the only nor the best solution. Uh, public safety is one of our main priorities. And, um, and if that's true, then now's the time to begin shifting money away from the police who have a very narrow training. And uh, instead we really need to diversify the ways in which our community can respond to neighbors in crisis. Um, last week, we saw in our nation's capital, um, rioters breach into that building and we're coming slowly to learn that those rioters, in some cases, were given tacit approval or worse by law enforcement. All police, including the MPD, need to start coming to terms with what their organizations are actually capable of. At worst, they are part of a union and organization that has deep ties to systems of racial harm and inequity in this country. And the MPD, whether we like it or not, as part of that system. Now is the time to defund the police and invest in food security, mental health, housing, and other mutually beneficial systems of care. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Peter. Hi, <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes. Uh, Peter Kalman. Um, I think it would be an important exercise to try to think about ways that we can reduce costs in the police department that are not related to numbers of um, officers. Uh, Burlington is beginning to look at this out of necessity. Are there jobs in, that, that are done, that do not have to be done by uniformed armed police people the people who have other kinds of skills that that are involved with policing. Um, just looking at sheer numbers of positions is not the only way to either save money or spend money. So it, it would I think it would be important for the for the police and for the and for the city council to or at least for the city manager to think about other ways to address the issues that are, are currently a demand on the uh, on the police and you know somebody mentioned lost wallets and you know cats up trees or whatever that's a there, there's an awful lot of 
really minor things that don't require an armed police officer. So decreasing the number of armed police officers doesn't necessarily mean, you know, overall decreasing uh, policing. It means spending your money on policing uh, more usefully. And I think one of the things that, that that is being overlooked here in all the Ds, you know, defunding, is disarming and demilitarizing police. Do we in Montpelier really need a highly armed, militarized police department? I don't think so. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. So that is the end of the list that I have. Cameron, do we have anyone else? Yes, we have Sean Stevens. Okay. And I think that's it right now. Um, again, if you want to speak, just raise your hand or speak up. Okay, uh, go ahead, Sean. Thanks, okay, starting my two minute timer. Um, my name is Sean Stevens. If you go over, it's really okay. <laughs> okay, um, I live in District 2 here in Montpelier. Um, I want to say, first of all, that I really appreciate the work that you guys have put together on the budget. It's highly complex and I really respect the amount of work that went into it. Um, it's a lot of work and I don't like that kind of work, so I'm glad that you guys are doing it. Um, I am here to speak on community safety and on the police. Um, I am in favor of um, uh, some version of community safety that looks at using sources other than the police. Um, I have been, I think I mentioned, I, I visited the council once before. I have been trying to read and study on this issue and listen to black and brown people with an open heart and an open mind as I hope we all have. Um, the last time I gave testimony, um, I was called or we were called extremists. And I, I've been thinking a lot about that since we got called extremists. And I, I feel like, um, I feel like it is a way to dismiss people and a way to, to, to be able to say to yourself, I don't have to listen to those people because they're extremists. I'm gonna request that you refrain from labeling me in that way. I don't think of myself in that way. Um, I am, like I mentioned before, just trying to listen to the voices of black and brown people and really study on this issue. Um, there's been a groundswell of Americans throughout the country that are looking to try to decrease police funding. Um, so I understand what, uh, what, the, what Bill Fraser pointed out about the fact that the, the police budget is a little complicated. Some of it is going to um, dispatch and some of it is going to police. Nevertheless, the broad takeaway is police are getting a rise when most other departments, uh, gosh, two minutes goes by fast. Um, okay. I can't kill myself one it's more. Okay. <laughs> um, or I, I'm gonna have to talk like an auctioneer. Um, so uh, so I get that, and yet it, it still seems, uh, as some other folks have pointed out, it's galling that that number is going out at precisely this time when there's both a call to decrease funding for police because of their role and what's happening in the US, what has been happening to black and brown and poor and mentally ill people in this country for a hundred years. Um, so I'm asking that we consider reducing the police department by two FTEs this year. Um, the police department is the most expensive department and the majority of the services that they provide could be provided um, more efficiently and better by other personnel. Um, Stephanie mentioned Montpelier exceptionism. I, I, I also want to point that out. Like it, I think it's premature for us to say, oh, all the other police departments all over the US, they're bad, but ours is great. Um, that, that, like, that just doesn't make sense. Like we don't have very many black people. We haven't had an opportunity to experience the problems that they're experiencing in Burlington. I don't want to dismiss the 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 value and the integrity of Mr. Pete and many of the other members of the department. But I also feel like that's not the central point. Nobody's arguing that, that Chief Pete's heart is not in the right place because it clearly is. But this, the question here is, what is the best way for us to improve community safety in our, in our 
town and in our state. And that means, by the way, not just killings, but stop and arrests and people getting sent to prison, incarceration, um, all the things that come along with, um, with the way policing is currently carried out. That's it, thank you. Thank you. And I, I see your hand there, uh, Nell. Nell Sather, go ahead. Hi folks, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I just wanted to very quickly um, uh, make my support known for the speakers who have advocated for low, um, decreasing the Montpelier police budget, or at the very least, not increasing it. Um, I really appreciate all the eloquent points that were raised by the folks before me. I just want to highlight some of them that really spoke to me. One being Montpelier's hypocrisy in, I, you know, thinking of ourselves or being thought of as a very progressive place, having Black Lives Matter written on our on State Street and to then not support or to not follow through on the action that's been asked from the Black Lives Matter campaign by not defunding the police or at the very least not increasing police budget feels very hypocritical and I feel that we can do better. And another point is um, the points that were raised in the letter to the editor about Montpelier's over-policing. I don't think that we need the uh, a police department the size that we have for our small, small um, little town. And lastly, I just want to say that I think this could be a great opportunity for Montpelier to show that we mean what we say and that we live by our values, our uh, the progressive values that many, not all <laughs> um, Montpelierites pride themselves on. Um, and yeah, just want to thank you all for, for listening to the public and for all the speakers who put a lot of time into um, into organizing and and rallying our community members. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Cameron, anyone else that you are seeing? No, ma'am. Anyone else that would like to speak? Okay. All right, well, thank you everyone Mayor, can, and that. Can I have, Mayor, can I have one more minute? Sure, go ahead, Stephen. Okay, um, I, I think it's, I'm, I'm focused. One, one thing I forgot to mention is that if you're gonna continue to fund Montpelier Live, they should be subject to public records law. The, the action that happened around my public toilet signs, art protest is unconscionable. And the fact that they claim that all their emails, while they're housed in City Hall, while they're, you know, using City Hall trucks to move the planters, uh, they need to be, that their funding needs to be conditioned upon them being subject to public records law. Um, that can be done by contract. Secondly, I've brought over the last years, brought to your attention, your police, our police officers, taking unopened beers from the homeless, harassing former residents who are attorneys for having a beer, sharing a beer up in the woods above below national life. We don't, we don't pay our police to police and prowl private property. That's national life's problem. That's their security. I've, I've brought to your attention, you know, the uh, historical abuses by our police department and and no one has ever followed up and asked that any of that be examined. So the fact that you want to maintain status quo or increase the police budget when it's on you as a council for not having followed up, validated, and verified these things, those are reasons to put, to cut our police budget. We've got abusive police. We've got we've got people shooting mentally ill people, killing mentally ill people on the Spring Street Bridge. You know, stealing beer from homeless people, uh, it, you know, harassing people for sleeping in their cars and citing false statutes. It's we've got a problem and it shouldn't wait another year for your police review commission to filter it down to where it's all politically. You know, we've got a, a cabal of, you know, entrenched the blue wall and are you considering them part of our family? And it's it's not right. Uh, it's time to trim trim the sales uh, in in management and in uh, abusive enforcement. And it's not just racism; it's classism. It's you know it's it's 
oppression of people who are politically outspoken, myself included. Um, Y'all need to take this seriously. And uh, I think I applaud Moreau's strategy. He rearranged things. It appears to have cut the police budget more than it does, but it rearranges and it de-polices. It it creates more social service uh, approach to the problems that we are traditionally shouldering upon the police. And it justifies and rationalizes a smaller, more modest, and appropriate scale police department. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, so there are a lot of a lot of thoughts in there, and um, uh, a lot of things that I think are worth um, are worth talking about. Um, so the first thing is about the ten percent. Um, increase to the um, police budget. And so Bill, um, do you want to talk about that briefly? Yeah, I, I'd be happy to talk about any of those budget type items. So first of all, I do understand people's uh, concern about a 10% increase. And I just want to make sure I'm clear about this. The police department, police actual patrol operations uh, increased 4.8%. Dispatch uh, went up about 20.6%. So the combination of the two is 10.4%. So while that is an accurate number, uh, the actual police operations that people are expressing concerns about did not receive a 10.4% increase. Uh, the second thing I wanted to make clear is that uh, there's actually a reduction of one position in the police. We've had 17 authorization for 17 full-time officers and this budget has 16. So uh, the 4.8% increase is solely in costs, just general costs of you know personnel, wages, benefits, things going up. It's not from new officers or expanded officers uh, is in fact one. And I think it's really important. This is sound kind of sounds you know wonky and Sean uh, referenced it. I appreciate that. But uh, some a fair amount of our, the city's operations are funded um, by other revenues which are down this year. And one of them is parking revenues. Um, and only those that are related to parking. So Part of my pay, for example, is parking. A part of the finance department is parking. All these things that, that deal with it. But police and dispatch is a huge, a, a large amount. So with parking down, those funding sources had to be shifted to the general fund. So we're seeing an unusual increase in the general fund, but their budgets as a whole are not up. It's the, it's the funding source that's up. Uh, if you look at their budgets, there is actually zero increase in police and dispatch uh, for any operating lines at all. Um, all the increases are in personnel. Um, and again, those are rising costs um, for, for things. And as I said, there's one less um, police officer. So I, I, I could say from the, the city manager's perspective, proposing the budget, I think from the councils, there was no desire or intent to inflate the police department or uh, somehow show, uh, as other people said, are, they, are we trying to ignore the will of the people? Uh, in fact, I think, as I said, we've reduced one position. Um, the other issue is this, this council did form a uh, committee to look at many of the questions that have been raised and that work is ongoing. They're actively meeting on a pretty regular basis. And the other thing is we are in a, an economic crisis right now as we build back and we see new revenues, whether they're parking or other things, um, one of the benefits of having converted these things is now is now we have the opportunity to look at different opportunities to use those revenues and perhaps build some of those back into some of the social services that we've talked about. So that has been part of our strategy. This year was really to just try to keep our base services. So I, that's the police, uh, someone did mention the size of the police department, and we did respond to that, I think, pretty publicly when it was raised. Our, our department is pretty normally sized for, for not only Vermont police, but uh, communities our size, it's particularly given the number of calls um, that we get compared to many other communities. Uh, someone mentioned the state, the impact of state uh, government, which absolutely has a, has a huge role on our, our police, as well as fire and others. Um, and I would point out that in a normal year, in the, the year we are in before the pandemic hit, we had actually budgeted for over $1 million in payment of lieu of taxes from the state to, to compensate the city for uh, services. Uh, obviously, we've reduced that estimate somewhat for this next year because the state budget 
is lower, but they do contribute uh, for um, a lot of our municipal services. So uh, that, that is um, not, you know, while it impacts the, uh, the need on the uh, expense side, uh, it is, is offset uh, in, in the tax rate from services uh, coming the other way. Someone mentioned, uh, talked about the SRO and the social worker. Uh, in fact, um, we are not receiving a, a one half percent the school, uh, well, excuse me, we, our budget assumes no revenue from the school at all for the school resource officer. Um, there is a position listed for that, but it's currently being used for patrol. And if the school chooses not to have um, a school resource officer, then that is the 16th officer, not the 17th officer. So um, there is no extra position there. We still do have the grant for the social worker position. And again, should we see more revenues? I think that is something we would look at expanding. Um, going, let me just see if there's something else I had about police that came up. Um, I mean, there's a lot that I think will be looked at by the, the committee, including de deployment of different resources. Um, Clearly, there are many calls that an armed police officer is not required for. There's no question about that. But because they do all sorts of different things, you never know when the next call is going to be. The same way that uh, we respond to ambulance calls with a fire truck in case they need to leave from the ambulance scene to a fire call. Um, so it's preparing for what other emergency might exist. There was a question raised about uh, the community service and two rec positions. Uh, our plan here, uh, the reason for that, uh, first of all, we weren't aware that the school had raised another position. However, the school did make a decision not to have us continue. That was their choice uh, to stop paying us. So that is a, a revenue loss um, for the city. So that is the reason for one of the, for at least looking at the position. And our thinking with the two rec positions was other two community service positions. Number one, at least this year, while most of our our leagues and summer camps and those kind of things are closed and not operating. We don't need to provide the same kind of field and outdoor maintenance that we normally do in a fully functional year. And so we are combining um, parks department and rec are combining this year to try to perform some of those services uh, with cemetery and others helping out. That is not intended to be a long-term sustainable situation. It was a, a COVID uh, crisis type reduction uh, and with DPW, similarly, the engineering position, um, we felt we could reduce that because we've also reduced the number of projects. So we don't need um, that. That is, again, something that would come back. Someone mentioned the street position. Um, we are actually adding, restoring two. We added two last year. So it's a net one. Um, we just aren't filling one of those two. Um, and I'd point out that water and sewer breaks are funded through the water and sewer fund, not through the general fund. And so the, the water and sewer maintenance staff is the same. Now, clearly the streets people help, but in terms of the immediate responses to water and sewer breaks, that staff has not been reduced. Um, just trying to look and see if there's anything else I can um, comment on, but if there's more questions, I'm happy to answer them. I hope I didn't. Well, I also want to jump back in here and um, make sure that I thank all of you. Thank you for taking the time um, to compose your thoughts, to share them with us. Um, uh, we we certainly we do appreciate that. We do um, you know we are we are listening to you. We're we're certainly um, trying to listen to you and and to um, you know process all of this. Um, the the other thing that I, I want to um, point out as well. Um, you know, I, I, I certainly, I, I was also thinking about, you know, when we painted Black Lives Matter on the street, like, let's make sure it's not performative. And so, like, what does that mean for us, right? So if, um, even though, like, just because of the way that our, our police budget um, works, this year, it happened to look like there's this 10% increase, when, uh, when really, it's, uh, it's effectively, um, it's basically the same, um, but but all that is also to say that there are other things, there are other steps that we um, were intentionally have already taken and are are planning to take um, around um, 
around the, the issue of racial justice. Uh, and so just to point out a couple of those. So uh, one thing um, city manager mentioned, um, I just wanna highlight was uh, the police review committee. So that, would, you know, if, if we're going to think about the direction of the police department, that is, that's the group that's um, gonna be able to have robust conversations about uh, about policing and become experts in best practice and um, have in-depth conversations. And that that's a group that's gonna come back to us to make some recommendations. Um, and the second thing is uh, we are it, actually in this budget uh, is included money for uh, this, uh, the social and economic justice committee to work with a consultant that's doing a, um, basically like a needs assessment for the city to see like where where are we falling down and where do we need to do better? Um, or what are our opportunities for doing um, better by, um, not just by um, uh, the BIPOC community, but also, you know, just um, folks who may otherwise not uh, have a voice at the table often. Um, so that that's also a group that is uh, working on recommendations for us that we are um, uh, we're going to see what they have to say, and then uh, so another thing that this budget does include is uh, funding for the capital area neighborhoods, and um, that is um, you. Uh, we talked a little bit about it last time, but um, it's basically a, a way to network uh, with with neighborhoods and that that may be a way for people to um, be in touch with each other for about about needs that they have that maybe um, don't require the police. Um, now that's that's uh, something that I think could evolve um, but let's have that conversation. Um, and uh, yeah so and all that is also to say you know uh, this is there's an open invitation to all of you uh, to continue this dialogue and to, um, you know, if if our if our answers aren't satisfactory here, like that's fine. Like let's let's keep talking about it. Um, and what else, you know, makes sense for us. Um, so so thank you. That's that's all I wanted to say about that for now. Um, oh, there was other one other thing. Um, there was one ask about uh, taking money. From the police to invest in education and just for context the way our budget works um, we don't um, the the school budget is just totally separate from our budget uh, in many cities around the country those things are combined like it's in it's all part of the same um, sort of package but um, ours our, our budget is is um, very separate from the from the school budget um, Yeah, I think I think that's all the things I wanted to say. Um, any other um, thoughts from council? Uh, Connor, go ahead. I'll, uh, I'll just piggyback off uh, some of the things you said, Mayor. Um, and, and first of all, nobody who's coming here, are, you're not extremists, you're, you're activists. And you know, you should be commended for spending your time at eight o'clock at night coming here and uh, holding us accountable as your elected officials. Um, that said, I, I think you, you got to give us the time we need to be thoughtful about this so we make intelligent decisions. I was reading Vermont Bigger. The Burlington Police Commission yesterday voted five to one. This is a commission of citizens um, to raise the cap on officers in Burlington because I think what they're finding is they just don't have enough people to get the job done. I was talking to a social worker up there and they said they made a 30% cut. It was quite, quite arbitrary. And that 30% cut didn't mean we got more social workers to do the job. What it meant was the work didn't get done. And that has bad impacts for people on the ground here. So I, I think when we have this police review study committee, we do want to take a hard look and examine it. But as elected officials, and I was talking to somebody in town, if the phone rings at three o'clock in the morning and there's a domestic assault in town, you need somebody ready to respond to that. And if we don't have people ready to respond to that, we're not fulfilling our obligation as elected officials here either. Um, if it could be readjusted the staffing levels where social workers, other people are dispersed and doing different jobs, maybe it's a regional approach, 
I think we're all ears listening to that. Um, but as far as reimagining the police uh, before the defund movement, we already started having some of these conversations about, okay, should we have a homelessness liaison position to be the face of people talking to the homeless population on the ground? Is that a better person than a uniformed officer? Uh, should we have a social worker in some cases uh, that should respond again, rather than a uniformed officer? So I think like, it might seem like small steps, but they are steps in the direction that you're talking about of having a more holistic look at this. Um, so I, I think we need, we need time. I think we need to be honest with you too uh, about what we feel like we can do. Um, and I think, you know, your comments are harsh sometimes, but keep coming, keep coming to the meetings, keep having the conversations with us. And uh, I, for one, and I think I could speak for the people around the table, you're not being blown off. It's these conversations are really happening in a meaningful way with these different committees, Jay's on the SRO commission. We wanna continue looking at it and not just drop the ball on this, but to make sweeping cuts um, in a very short period of time uh, without actually looking at the staffing levels. It might not make financial sense if you have officers working a ton of overtime, burnt out, making bad decisions. Maybe you're not, not enough staff to actually be able to walk a beat, get familiar with the population. I, I think in my mind, these are the things we need to keep in, in the discussion and under consideration. Uh, before we make deep cuts into the department. So let's continue listening to each other. Um, and I really do appreciate everybody who spoke tonight. Thank you. Uh, Donna. Uh, likewise, I, I appreciate Ann and Connor's comments and, and all the speakers. Can't say enough when people talk to us. And we do listen. We may be more slow in responding than you like, but not only do I want you to come back to talk to us, I really want you to join at the tables find a city committee and it may be directly related to the police it may not but get a, a sense of working and help us change we only involve from the inside out and i would love to have your creative thinking at any of our committees any you'd be more than welcome thank you thank you uh lauren yeah thanks um i also am really grateful and really appreciate having a an engaged community and accountability and um you know was was right there too when we approved the black lives matter painting that this is not the the end of the story but um you know a, a continuation and and really you know in many ways doubling down on a commitment um but that needs real action um you know it's it's a very interesting week and a half to be having this conversation um looking back and looking forward and you know on on one hand i am extremely grateful at the hard work our police department is doing right now we know that there are threats of armed protests in our city within the next week and there has been a an incredible amount of really dedicated work looking at how we can com keep our community safe and i'm really grateful that they're doing that right now um I also, you know, hear hear loud and clear, and have read a lot of the same things um, that everyone speaking tonight has, um, and have been serving on the police review committee, and really encourage people to come to that. These are public meetings; it's a public process. There's go going to be, um, you know, more specific engagement opportunities, but those are happening on the second and fourth Mondays at 4:30. You can find the the meeting schedule on. Uh, on the city website, but like these exact conversations are happening and you know it's happening at the pace of government. But as a council, as, as Connor mentioned, you know, we really wanted to look carefully and not just make a political statement and you know make a cut without, you know, well, okay, how are we providing a service if we're gonna change things around? What does that mean? What are the implications for other city staff and so on? So the conversations are happening, looking at the data, how are people spending their time, what services are we funding? All of all of the exact conversations, and it just you know it's all complicated as you can imagine, um, and so you know I really would love people to be showing up in that venue as well as that conversation um, is rolling out, um, and you know as there's ongoing public uh, comment opportunity, and also with the social and economic justice advisory committee that I serve on, there's going to be public engagement opportunities with that as well as we try to. Um, you know, look not just at policing, but at other equity issues within our community and what we can be doing to also address those. So um, again, thanks for coming and uh, appreciate all the, all the input and uh, spotlighting on these really important issues.
Great, thank you. Uh, Dan, go ahead. Thanks. Um, I actually had one question for Bill. Bill, um, the increases, the personnel cost, um, those are tied to the, are those tied to the union contract? Um, uh, we don't have union contracts right now um, for police, for actually for any of our units for next year, um, we're in, we'll be bargaining them. But it's anticipating. We assume two, we put in 2%. We didn't, as we said, we didn't do any this year with the exception of the one uh, fire that was um, already bargained. So, so it includes an estimated 2% cost uh, adjustment as well as um, steps that people might be entitled to or costs of insurances, those kinds of things, you know, the inflationary costs, but it's not due to additional employees. Okay, right. So I mean, it, it's it's just for existing costs that we're anticipating. Um, and I think that's an important point that, you know, we going into this budget really instructed uh, the city manager to hold, hold firm on uh, keeping the budget as level funded as possible, which really means cuts because um, we are missing these revenue sources and um, it was with the mind of the residents of Montpelier, which is, you know, how do we preserve services, core and essential services that we all have relied upon? Maybe not each one of us relying on each service, but as a general population, as a commonwealth of citizens, we have relied on these services. Um, and we made a decision to make this a human budget, uh, which is to say every line in this budget just about that relates to personnel relates to a person an individual who has a family um, who is depending upon the salary and benefits that the city of montpelier provides um, and you know I, I for one was not in favor of a budget that would cause that kind of personal hardship at this time to individuals um, you know who have served the city um, and you know we can talk about next year, and we may have to um, budgets that talk about a constricting of certain services and, and reducing them. But one of the goals here was to keep the services on the table um, that we've come to rely upon, and to to uh, recognize the staff of the city and and their contributions to um, our working as a as a city, um, and to. To preserve them, to give them that that security, because at the end of the day, those are those are individuals who go home and they support their families, um, and I think that's a really important way to think about a budget, because we're we're funding these um, these positions that people consider their jobs that have put years into, um, and you know that that was really one of the thrusts in that. So if some of that results in in personnel overruns. You know, I don't think that's necessarily hypocrisy. That's, um, but it is holding on to the idea that these individuals, this this father or mother or parent or sister that has to um, support a family, can continue to do so. Um, I I think the example that was given before about the D.C. police is is interesting because um, I, I saw the videos and you know there were two examples. Uh, the example was brought up in some of the public comment about the speak about the uh, officers who seemed to let people into uh, the Capitol who took selfies with some of the rioters and looters. Um, but there were also other examples of, of police putting their bodies in harm's way in suffering injuries, protecting the building and protecting the individuals inside. Um, and Eugene Goodman, whose name cannot be said enough, I think, who um, saved a number of lives by diverting a crowd of people running up the stairs away from the Senate chamber that was unsecured. Um, that's the kind of bravery that uh, these type of first responders demonstrate, you know, and you can go back to 9-11, to people running into danger and uh, not, not running away from danger. So I think there's a, you know, there's that that split and there's that dilemma. And I think that the objections and the issues that have been raised about, you know, do we need armed police? Do we need 
these type of, of um, uh, forces in our uh, in our communities are, are important questions to ask. And I, you know, I support the asking of them. I supported the police review committee for those exact reasons um, that we have to look, we have to always be better. And we are not um, simply because we're in Vermont uh, immune from uh, the societal ills, but to ignore the contributions that the individuals make within that and the role that they do play, um, you know, I think is, is we have to be careful because that could, that's that in some ways you know weights the question unfairly, and I think that we have to think about those issues. and And that brings me to really my last point, which is I think a lot of the concerns that were expressed tonight, and I share my fellow counselors' response of saying thank you for bringing this forward. Thank you for talking about this. Um, you know, we welcome this kind of public comment, public feedback. Uh, we all have tough skins, so you know if you wish to frame it um, in a way um, that, you know, cuts, that's a way of getting people's attention, that's fine. Um, but I think at the end of the day, we have to look at the data and we have to look at the information and we have to look at the bigger picture. And that's where I think the police review committee can do a lot of good. Um, you know, making a cut on a line item in a budget has unintended consequences sometimes. Um, and it doesn't necessarily do what's intended. Um, and I think the cities that are most serious about this, and, and the example I would give is, is Minneapolis this summer made sudden cuts to the budget um, and had to reverse them a few weeks later. Um, you know, if we're talking about true, true change, it, it's a slow process. It may not be as fast as you want it to be, um, but it's one that's thoughtful and one that can, can bear weight. And Edmund Burke uh, contrasted the American Revolution with the French Revolution on exactly those terms. And noted that you know there there has to be um, a thoughtful process as opposed to one that's driven by sort of a passion. Um, and Jonathan Swift said, "Imagination getting astride of reason um, is the is you know is where we lose sense." Um, and in that respect, you know, I urge you know you to keep that passion and keep that issue, these issues coming up. But um, you know, we have to work through this process. Thanks. Sorry. No worries. Anyone else? Uh, Jack, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, we will be have this. This is a this is a big project. You know, we've got our uh, our budget book, which you've seen. There's lots of pages, lots of lines of expenditure, and what we're we're going through another uh, public hearing next week, and and the goal is uh, the goal that I have, and I think most of the members of the council have, is to provide a whole range of essential services that uh, the city, the uh, residents of the city uh, rely on and really demand from their city government. And uh, in gen most often are services that uh, only a municipal government can uh, can provide, and so we are looking at uh, a whole range of things. Public safety and law enforcement are core government functions, and uh, we have people who have every right to expect that we will provide those services. I have uh, constituents, people out in the city, who have emailed me or contacted me in other ways ways who uh, who are demanding sustained uh, police and uh, public safety uh, services and funding because they they value the services I've worked with community members and the police to uh, deal with uh, with problems that really require a law enforcement uh, response um, as with law enforcement and and with other areas, we're uh, we're trying to look at the government always looks at whether we're doing the things in the uh, in the way that works best for the community, or are there things that uh, we could be doing different differently? I'm serving on the uh, police review committee. We're meeting uh, twice a month. It's uh, it's a heavy schedule and. Uh, and we are looking, going to be looking at 
well, what's, what's the need for police services and what's the best way to meet that need? We already know that uh, the city council has uh, directed funding into a social work position. We know that the city council has directed uh, funding to services for, uh, for a homeless population. We have, uh, we're as uh, Lauren and others have mentioned, we're doing other things to ensure that we're uh, fulfilling our, uh, our desire to have uh, a fair and equitable community, and we will uh, we will continue doing that. Um, I we are in, look at looking at other areas. We're um, we've looked at uh, public works. Um, people are familiar with the alternate side of the street parking policy we adopted this year, and that was also an effort to examine how we're providing our streets and public works services to be uh, efficient and, and responsive to the community. And I think that that's going to, as we get, when we get to the end of the winter, I think we're gonna find that that's been a successful uh, change in what we do. And, uh, and across the, uh, the city government and, and throughout the budget, we are addressing ways that we can meet the community's needs and to provide a level of, uh, service that we can have essential services that we can provide given the uh, serious hit we took uh, due to the pandemic. Um, having said all that, I think where we are now and the proposed budget that, uh, that we have now is a responsible way to serve the, uh, the needs of our community on a short-term basis from now up out to about a year and a half from now in July of, in June of uh, 2022. And um, as many of us have observed, if we thought that the uh, budget challenges we're facing now were going to continue for multiple years into the future, we'd be looking at the budget differently. Uh, but because we want to be able to maintain the level of services and the workforce and bring, bring it back as, as quickly as we possibly can. I think where we are now is, I think we have a responsible budget uh, providing the services we should be able to provide and, and can provide. And um, I don't know if we need a motion to uh, adopt this budget to the next public uh, hearing or if, we don't need that because it's already uh, scheduled. But if, if it is, I would make a motion right now to uh, adopt this budget uh, for and present it at the next public hearing. I'll second. Okay, um, there's been a motion and a second. Um, I'm gonna officially close the public hearing. Um, and assume that I opened it when I invited people to, to speak. Um, and all right, so any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay. Um, all right, well, thank you again, um, everyone. And let's, uh, let's keep an open dialogue about this. Um, all right, so we are going to move on to um, the item from the consent agenda, which was um, the ACCD grant, which, yeah. yes, yes, go ahead. I just wanted to remind folks while they're still on, the people that are interested in the budget, that the next hearing is next Thursday, the 21st, 6.30. Not Wednesday, yep. Right, thank you, yes. Okay, um, so uh, Cameron, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so I'm here to discuss the potential um, grant application for the ACCD um, Better Places grant. It is a t up to $20,000 no match grant to make, um, honestly, to make better places. 
So city staff got together. I worked with a pretty large group of city staff from planning DPW, um, parks, and Montpelier Alive to sort of brainstorm what we could do with that type of funding um, since Confluence Park did get sort of funded through other grants. So that was our initial thought. And then the bigger thought came, how do we really re like renovate and revolutionize sort of the corridor of coming into town? And that became really our main focus is how do we invigorate that space? Um, you know, we moved, y'all moved recently to sort of pay for that space from the state. And right now it's sort of, a, it's just an empty lot. And um, while we know and sort of acknowledge in this grant that you guys could make decisions to do anything with that lot in the future, right now um, it is remaining empty. And so we really wanted to write a grant that um, invigorated and opened that space. Um, one of the things that that potentially included was moving the Girton Park structure. So it would move it from where it is currently onto the space, um, we'll call it 12 main. Um, <laughs> so at the 12 main space, so it, it opens up that area, makes it more um, available to the public, makes it more open and inviting. So it can still be used um, as a gathering space, but it can also be used as something that is an impromptu stage for performances. Um, the proposal also includes making it more of a um, sort of ad hoc parklet, um, having some recreation opportunities for the youth in the form of a pump track, which we thought was really innovative. And I really thank Alec for bringing that opportunity to us um, and really allowing it to be a public art space. Part of the grant also includes um, soliciting for a local artist to create either a mural is our assumption, but it could be anything in that space. Um, you know, really also focusing on outdoor recreation as a something that spurs economic development as well. I know that might seem far-fetched, but if you create a place for people to go and to gather in our downtown district, we really do think that that's something that's missing currently and that, that this could fulfill. Um, you know, we want to make sure that this answers some of the questions that we've had about Girton Park, if that's something that y'all are interested in, in approving us, you know, including in this um, grant application. It doesn't mean it will happen. Hopefully we get the grant if we apply for it, but, um, you know, it, it will remain um, a memorial on one hand, but it also will remain a public space along the Greenway. It's right up, I'm sorry, the Stephen Oabe multi-use path. Still trying to get Greenway out of my head, apologize. Um, but it's right there next to the multi-use path. And so it becomes sort of a corridor from the multi-use path into our downtown economic area and also sort of a gateway to our other park systems. Um, so I did want to share the this initial site plan. I will say it's already gone undergone changes since we created the site plan. Ward Joyce is working very closely with us. Um, before I show it to you and share it with you, I do want to state that um, we've talked to Paige Gurton. Um, we actually talked to her right before this meeting at 5.30 and um, she's comfortable with our proposal. And, uh, um, you know, we've had a really great um, dialogue with her about this. So I'm going to pull up the pictures and share them. I, which is, this is probably the best angle. Can you all see that? Okay. Yes, we can. I saw Donna's thumbs up. So, um, so I will say that. I know. Can, can somebody email me that document yes. because I'm only on voice. Yes, I will, Stephen. Thank you. Um, so this site plan already has undergone some changes. Um, the Girton Park structure will hopefully um, have the back of it towards the sidewalk so that it can be a public sort of stage in this area so that folks can gather here. Um, I want, I mainly want to draw your attention to the back here by the river where um, we've also included another memorial site closer to the river um, to really acknowledge that the initial Burton Park structure was a memorial. So including that in the back there by the river. Um, I think that is, well, I'll also say again, this site plan is already outdated. We've asked for the playground to be taken out because playgrounds open up a whole world of liability that we cannot afford to take on with a $20,000 grant. 
Um, but the coolest part about this is that the pump track and a potential skate ramp, that was a Ward Joyce um, put that in there. I think that's great. They create, they, I didn't know this, so I'm sharing this information. Um, they create a rubberized surface that people can put on to skate ramps, et cetera, that dull the noise so it doesn't become a very noisy and um, disruptive thing, which uh, skate park technology has come a long way, um, apparently. So just want to point those things out. And I'll stop sharing and I'll email this to Stephen. Um, uh, Stephen, I'll put it in there as well that this is a um, definite draft and we'll probably undergo changes before we submit it to ACCD, but this is definitely um, sort of where we're at right now. So I've been rambling at you for a little bit. So hopefully I picked the narrative up there and I haven't missed anything. Um, did anyone have any questions? It looks great, absolutely great. And I appreciate the visual as well as what you put in the written stuff. It's great, thank you. Okay, super. Other comments or questions? Uh, Jack, go ahead. Um, I, I think it looks great. I think it's uh, it's a great thing, uh, great op uh, recreational opportunity in the, in the center of town, as uh, which I think we need. And uh, as long as we're in the position of not having a final plan for what to do with that uh, real estate, I think I think this is a, a good thing. Um, could you talk at all about the uh, conversations with uh, any advocates for the homeless that you might have had as, uh, as part of this discussion? So we've brought this up a few times with the Homelessness Task Force, and I know that uh, Council Member Casey has spoken directly to folks there, um, as well as the, the peer um, outreach worker for a, a Good Samaritan has also talked to folks at the shelter there. And people aren't, and I, I'm going to say this in generalities, no one has said this to me directly. But from the reports that I've received, people are not using that as a overnight shelter. According to Good Sam, they have gotten every single person that was coming to um, the overflow shelter into short-term housing at this time. So people are using it as a hangout spot like anything should be used on a bike path, right? What we're, you know, so um, it might be uh, maybe them not being taken care of well, but it's not being used as a shelter. Um, I know that our uh, uh, homeless service providers are working very hard and diligently right now to get new opportunities for an, a longer term and real and holistic shelter instead of relying on our church systems. Um, that again is not a city necessarily um, project, so I can't really speak more to that right now, but I do know that a lot of those things are in the works. Um, but it's not a permanent solution, but moving it doesn't seem like it would deter anyone from using it as a hangout spot. So. Um, it would still be used as that, but again, it's right on the walking path. It's right next to the sidewalk. So there is more visibility if we're concerned about, you know, improper use of that. It really does move it to a space that has more oversight. Um, so I hope that addresses your question. Um, it does. If I could, if I could uh, follow up, I, I had a conversation this afternoon with, uh, with Ken Russell and, and Don Little and, uh, and I heard much the same thing. I think people, we, we all know this, people need places to hang out. You know, it's uh, in urban studies, it's called, you know, a third place. It's someplace it's not your home and it's not your work, but you have some places to uh, hang out and interact with people. And, and I think this is uh, that when before I opposed uh, moving the, uh, park structure, it was because it was uh, seeming like it was taking that away. And I, I feel uh, pretty good about, about this idea, keeping in mind that as I uh, mentioned in my conversation with Don and Ken this afternoon, obviously the way we fix the problems that uh, people who don't have homes are facing is to make sure that we don't have people that don't have homes. And uh, 
we we need you know, housing is what is uh, is a fundamental necessity of life, and we we need to keep uh, pressing it on that area. But uh, but I support this. I don't want to prematurely cut off discussion, but uh, I would move to uh, approve this. I'll second it. Okay. Um, there's been a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Uh, Connor, go ahead. And I, I just want to chime in. Cameron mentioned it. I, I have spent a few hours there over the last few weeks. Um, I probably only had conversations with four people, so I don't pretend to, that that's everybody who hangs out there. Uh, but the four I did speak to, um, all of them had a place to stay that night. Um, so they weren't completely dependent uh, on that, that structure. And uh, the invitation was extended to be part of the sort of the ad hoc uh, committee with Dan and myself as we look at this. And, and there, there wasn't any interest. So really did try to, you know, kind of take the pulse of it and uh, didn't, didn't get a ton of feedback there. Uh, Donna, go ahead. I would like for us to come to some decision if it's a 12 or a 16. And that the motion carries no matter what number we end up putting on this location. We do know the location, right? Yes. And let us know what is the decision. If we have to make it or staff makes it, but I would like to know so we can talk about that property and assign it one number and we really get used to calling it that name. Our DPW okay. staff recommended 16. Okay, great. 16 okay. main, terrific. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, Jay, Madam go ahead. Mayor, uh, we'll, we'll go Jay and then Stephen. Go ahead. All right, Cameron. I just wanted to um, just wrap my head around the numbers a little bit. So the um, the ACCD grant application is for how much, and that's based on on which design. I know that you know you've taken out the you know the um, jungle gym and and the play equipment, but I'm, I just want to wrap my head around the numbers a little bit. So the grant is up to 20,000. Our budget is incomplete at this time, but I assume that it will be at that 20,000 is what we'll be asking for. So the site plan is um, still under development, but it will include a pump track, um, a memorial space at the back of the lot, um, movement of Girton Park benches, um, and uh, some decorative, the art, the public art, and the decorative space to hide the dumpsters. Um, a lot of that will be, most of it will be going to sort of the building of this space. Um, some of it will be going to the artists to make sure that they're paid for their work and then materials. Um, and I think I might, and landscaping obviously, and I think I might be missing something, but um, in general, that's what the work will be for. Montpelier Alive is also planning quite a few activation activities for that space as well. Like when I said um, sort of a all, all season space for people to be there, Montpelier Alive and their partnership of this have planned a lot of like events that could happen there throughout the seasons. Um, so some funding would go for that as well. Gotcha, I mean, I, I, I love and fully support the idea. It, it feels like it's uh, um, well beyond a $20,000 project to make happen, um, even without a swing set. Um, it, Everyone in terms has of said that they feel comfortable with that amount. Um, I think who, who said that? Uh, I'm working with planning, DPW, parks, and Ward Joyce is our sort of site plan designer right okay. now. Good. No, that's great. I just, uh, it, yeah, it's super. It is, it is ambitious, but I think we can, we can make it work. All right. Thank you. Um, Stephen, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'm, I missed the part where the uh, obligation to pay for that uh, property came from. Uh, it was still, if I'm not mistaken, that money was still due the trans, B trans. Uh, but uh, secondly, I, I think we should separate the question. I believe that the having this resolution embedded in the consent agenda, even if it's broken out now, that in effect preordains that Girton Park is going to be moved no matter what trouble this design runs into down the line, whether the grant is made, whether the public likes the design, whether the, you know, it, it really just seems uh, cynically uh, 
manipulative the way it's been presented. Uh, I'm all for, I, I, I also, I differ in that we're about to face we're about to see a end to the eviction moratorium. You're get, you're likely to see a lot more people, even if we've temporarily housed the ones that were mostly on the street. Um, the privacy implication can't be underemphasized. That the the place where you could, you know, talk or you know have a beverage or whatever. That that there's an autonomy in the current location that it doesn't exist uh, on Main Street. Um, the, I believe that one of the more little understood, but one the, the kind of core uh, erosions of the mental health of the unhoused population has to do with the lack of privacy, the lack of a place to gather your thoughts or feel unscrutinized. And I don't think we're factoring that in here. I think in fact, I heard uh, someone state the, uh, the oversight that was desired and more desirable of having this, you know, thing moved to this location. So I believe that the application for the grant should proceed, but the decision, the resolution to move the structure is premature. Um, I would like an opportunity with the design in hand and with the you know, implications to be able to review it with the folks. I'm, I'm an advocate uh, who speaks to a lot of folks uh, on the margins, and I don't believe we've done our due diligence here by any stretch. Um, I also agree with Jay that the, the number is grossly under, uh, you know, departments don't have to take responsibility for their uh, underestimates when it's, you know, a no name, no face, no document. Um, I believe that we need to uh, nail this plan down in detail uh, if we get the grant uh, and do things in the proper order. And resolving to move the thing is not the proper order. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Well, and indeed, we there's no guarantee that we will um, get this grant. And um, even if we do, as it is, this is um, more or less a... Uh, if I, I don't think this is incorrect. Uh, it is more or less a temporary plan um, as we continue to decide what will happen uh, with that space in the long term. So, uh, in any case, there will be certainly be times to um, review. Them. So, okay. Mayor, any I forgot one. Mayor, I forgot one key point. In our priorities to not to have this. Uh, Artistic endeavor take precedence over public restrooms is absolutely absurd and shameful. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Stephen. Um, all right. Any further discussion? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay. I'm seeing no opposed. So um, the motion passes. And I think um, we are, well, we're, we're at 8.30, which would be a convenient time to take a break. Um, but I also just want to look at some of the things. There are some things that we really do need to get to tonight. Um, and my hope is that we can get through all of the things actually. Um, but I may, uh, is, is it, urgent to have the uh, second quarter budget status review um, tonight. It's not that urgent. Is it's, it was a commitment that we made that you had asked for with regard to yeah. the, um, with the, um, you know, the interim budget that we put in the mitigation plan. I think the, yeah. the short version is, is Kelly. Could tell you is that we're sort of on track. We're not ahead or behind. We're right where we thought we'd be. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, let's. Um, the other thing is, like, if we move that, then Kelly has to stay. <laughs> um, so that's my only uh, consideration there. Uh, but 
uh, let's uh, let's take a ten minute break and then we'll we'll decide what we want to do. Is that fair? <laughs> okay. Um, I will see. It's eight thirty. I'll see you all in ten minutes. Uh, okay, I'm just gonna go ahead and say that I have faith that we can make it through this agenda, which means let's just do it so that um, Kelly can give her update and then she'd probably, I mean, you'd say or not, up to you. But let's um, let's uh, uh, do the, the review of the second quarter of budget. Sure. And I, I promise that I'll make it quick. Um, can everybody hear me okay? I think my sound was a little bit off earlier, um, so I've turned it up. And hopefully that's okay, that's great. It was a little soft, but we could okay. hear you. Okay, good deal. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and um, share my screen um, and walk you through this presentation. And let's see here. Oh, lost it. Hold on. Okay, you can see this. Okay. Yep. Right. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to walk you through kind of where we started the deficit mitigation plan um, and where we are. Um, and so as you can see, this is what we were looking at for revenue downgrade um, in 21. Um, so in terms of revenue, just over $1.1 million. Um, and then, you know, just over $265,000 in the parking fund. Um, and so I'm going to move on to our rescission summary, which is the total of those downgrades and items that we came up with. Um, and you know, it's across the spectrum. There are um, personnel-related cuts. There's capital and equipment, um, and there's also some of our um, community enhancements that were also um, reduced to just make way and make room um, for the difficult conditions that we're facing. Um, so that being said, you know, we are within range with this plan and it's um, taking hold. So I'm pleased to report that. I'm also pleased to report that we have received um, uh, CARES funding. Um, so that's really exciting too. So that'll really help us weather the storm. But, you know, we're six months through and six months left. So we've just got to be careful as we proceed. But I feel like we're in pretty good shape considering what we've seen. So this slide here just kind of breaks it down and provides kind of a, a net result for you. So we're about $25,000 to the good right now as it stands. Um, if we're taking you know, all things, um, deficit shortfall, and then comparing it to what we're actually seeing at the close of the second quarter. Um, so as you can see, um, our taxes and fees are a little bit better than what we had anticipated to the tune of about um, $313,000 or so. Um, and that's in large part due to the fact that we actually ended up receiving our full pilot payment um, that, you know, we had initially booked down because we just weren't sure. I'm not sure if we'll be um, as lucky in 22, but at least we did receive that here. So you can see that direct impact here in the um, first quarter or second quarter rather. Um, we still do have some downs associated with FY20 that are coming into um, 21. Um, some of them are capital related and some of them um, are related to 21 and their program and user fees and the like. We're just keeping a really close eye on them, but you'll note that it's um, better than what we had anticipated. Um, but then the parking fund is not better than what we had anticipated. We're just not seeing the revenues coming in. Um, we're able to support enforcement, but it has really um, forced us to take a really close look at the parking fund um, to make sure that it's viable you know, now and moving forward. Um, and so as we get down into these categories here, you can kind of see that you know, there have also been shifts in what we've seen for reductions. Um, I wanna note the personnel line in particular because it seems low based on what we were projecting, but there are some things that are netting against that. Um, such as we've had some staff transitions. Um, there are associated costs with public safety and COVID related needs that are kind of netting out here, but we also did receive COVID funding. So we're actually in an okay spot. Um, and then in terms of operating, there were a few contractual things that we thought we might be able to 
um, mitigate, but it turns out as we move towards a more managed um, service IT contract, it's a little bit more expensive but in the long run. I think it's actually going to work out quite well and is actually proven um, to be extremely beneficial as we've gone remote um, and being able to support the IT needs of the city, um, making sure that we're secure. It's just really essential. So we're going to be set up for the future. Um, and, you know, we are still able to meet the need of the current conditions. Um, and then, oh, Jack, did you have a question? Yes, um, I'm turning it over. Yes. Uh, thinking about uh, the experience at Legal Aid with uh, with migrating most of the work to home, did we have to uh, buy a lot of uh, laptops for people to, uh, to do working from home? So we did purchase some laptops. We were able to crowdsource some laptops also, and we were able to use existing desktops and maybe, you know, assign somebody, you know, two desktops. So one from home and one at work. So they didn't have to lug it back and forth. And um, we've gotten creative. Um, and we were also able to negotiate into our managed services contract um, more laptops to just, you know, we know that this, this remote work is not probably going away anytime soon. And we know that we're going to need to be nimble. So the answer is yes. And um, we're trying to make the most of, you know, what we have. Are we, uh, are we relying on anyone uh, using their uh, own home or their own owned computers for that? Not at the moment. Um, however, with the managed service contract, uh, the way once we migrate to the cloud, folks will be able to log on using a personal device. We can't currently do that just because of the security concerns and the network. Um, but once we do switch over completely to cloud-based, folks would have the option if they wanted to. That being said, we are making sure that the um, technology is available for folks that need it to work from home. Oh, that's good. And the concern, the security is certainly what I was thinking about. Yeah, but totally. When we, we went the first period of time with a lot of people just using their own home computers and the security was, was a real concern at that time. Yeah, we've, we've been really particular about that, especially in looking at this contract and making sure that as we stand up you know, to the cloud because we're still in the process of migrating. Um, and right now we're still sort of one foot in, one foot out. Um, but yeah, security is a big issue. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, and then for capital, you can see here that the only difference from what we had put in the deficit mitigation plan and what's noted here is the accounting for the power stretchers that we purchased um, through municipal lease financing. So I just took that down a little bit just to reflect that it's about $9,000 or so. Um, so Again, we're in pretty good shape, although, you know, it's just, it's with a little bit of caution that I say that um, because we still have six months left of the year to cover. Um, and so th this is the slide that I wanted to show you with the COVID money that we've received so far. Um, a big chunk of it is related to the local government expense reimbursement um, grant. And so we um, did put in for you know, items like plexiglass barriers, some laptops, um, personnel costs that were eligible. Um, we did have some shifts in duties that are associated here. Um, so, you know, we feel pretty fortunate to be able to have secured that funding. So it'll, again, really help us as we get on. Let's see, oh, don't wanna jump ahead here. So the parking fund, here's our plan for dealing with the parking fund. Um, so if the trend continues right now, we're down about $177,000. Um, and if that continues into the second half of the year, then it's about $354,000. Um, and so we're really monitoring the fund pretty closely and seeing you know, how those revenues are coming in. Um, we have enough to support our enforcement staff. So you know, in terms of you know, where we need to be for what the fund, you know, has to support as a core um, piece, we're doing that, but not much else. Um, and so, you know, we are shifting allocations from the parking fund to the general fund. Um, and that's where, you know, some of our planning with a mitigation plan really helps because we've made that room um, to be able to do that. And then I also do want to mention something that's actually pretty exciting. And so it's good news in a time like this, we've been working on it. And I had been hopeful that we would get to it sooner, but by the end of the month, we'll have Park Mobile rolled out in the city. 
which will really help um, with our aging um, parking meters. Um, so it's something that we had talked about on the list of things that we would need to fund. Um, and so as we move forward, you know, we may not need to. Um, we may be able to just use the Park Mobile app for credit card transactions and then coin for the meters. Um, so they're still they're still accessible. Um, and then the Park Mobile um, app itself will give us access to a lot more data around our parking in different zones. And so as things get better, we'll be able to build those revenue models and projections a little bit more accurately with the data that we get. Um, and so in the interim, you know, we'll keep an eye on things, we'll shift, you know, personnel costs away, but then we're also looking at ways to reduce certain credit card fees if we're using the Park mobile app, which is net neutral to the budget. And then also looking at other options like, you know, freezing equipment purchases and other purchase, purchase services. So I think we've got a good plan. We've just got to stick to it. So my recommendation is to kind of, you know, hold the line, be as conservative as we can be with spending um, in hopes that, you know, you know, we end up in a better spot. We just don't know that yet. Um, and, you know, the pandemic is just dragging on. And, you know, we know that with the rollout of the vaccine being a little bit slow, you know, we'll see. But I think we're in a good position to um, be as nimble as we need to be. And so I would recommend keeping the plan in place, spending on essential operational items only, and then maintaining our hiring freeze only in areas where it's necessary. Um, and then as conditions improve, we'll add things back. Um, we are looking at that prioritization list right now. So that then we have a list to come back to you with. Um, so it's a pretty clear kind of, you know, what we would do next um, if we had the funding. Um, so that's, that's my presentation. I'm happy to go back to slides. I'm happy to answer any questions. I just want to thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, if you um, can stop sharing your screen at this point. For some reason, I, okay, there we go. Great. Any other questions um, for Kelly at this point? Uh, Jack, go ahead. Thank you. Kelly, this is a great presentation. I appreciate it. Um, I, I was thinking this isn't directly targeted to this presentation. So if you don't have the answer and you want, want to just uh, tell us next time, that would be fine. But one of the one of the commenters in the public hearing had some questions about the budget. And one of them had to do with, uh, it was Rachel Desolettes. And one of the questions had to do with uh, uncollected property taxes. And um, is, is there some, anything you can tell us about uncollected property taxes and what the rate is right now and how we handle them? So I can give you sort of a, a general explanation, but I would need to, you know, actually craft an answer to give you the specifics. I did pull the details, but I didn't, you know, prepare it for tonight. Um, initially, when we were experiencing this downturn, I did take a look to see where our um, delinquency rates have been in the past, um, and we've held pretty steady, um, you know, and I just looked at the best example that is attributable to this one, the Great Recession. And still, surprisingly, um, people were paying their property taxes. I mean, we do have some delinquencies now that this thing is dragging on a little bit more. Um, and as they come in, they are booked. Um, you can see within the budget lines that there are um, penalties and interests uh, that we do book on the lines. Um, so that that's there. Um, but in terms of you know providing details on trending and where we are actually to date, um, I would want to just look at that a little bit closer, and I'm happy to provide that for next time. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Okay, uh, anyone else? Okay. Thank you again, Kelly. Thanks for this update. Kelly. You're welcome. Oh, uh, sorry, Connor, did you have something? Oh, I was thinking, Kelly. Oh, <laughs> All right, super. Awesome. Uh, okay, so moving on uh, in our agenda, um, the next thing is uh, 
potential adoption of a resolution uh, regarding the national election and related events. Um, so I'm sure that many of you saw the uh, YouTube video I put out uh, just the other day. Uh, in my mind, it did three, three things. Um, condemned the attacks on uh, the Capitol, the uh, Washington DC uh, Capitol. Um, it uh, asked, well, it, uh, it informed people that uh, the Capitol, or that, sorry, that the state house would be closed, that the school buildings would be closed and city hall would be closed. And then third thing is um, asking people to refrain from uh, in-person uh, direct uh, counter protesting. Um, and I, I know some of you wanted to um, also weigh in on that. And I think that's perfectly fair. There's actually an addition that I, I would like to propose um, to it, but I know um, Jack also had some thoughts on this. Um, so uh, Jack, I'm, I'm gonna just pick on you first um, and let you go first. And then I'll, I'll make my amendment <laughs> suggestion as well. Go ahead. Well, thank you. I, I think uh, I, I reviewed the uh, the latest version of it and I, and I think you caught uh, everything that I was interested in talking about. There were, I had some pretty small editorial changes and I think those are all incorporated in the uh, draft the way it is now. I should look and see if there's something that, uh, are, you, can, are you thinking of something that I sent you that, uh, didn't make it in here that I should be talking about? Um, no, so my uh, my proposal is sort of um, just a different ask, a different chunk, it's a different thing. Okay, so, so yeah, I don't have anything to ask you to change more than what you've already changed, so thank you. Okay, um, so I also just want to um, I think it's I think it's fair that in addition to if we're gonna ask um, counter protesters to um, well, really for people to refrain from counter protesting um, I, I think we also need to ask anybody who's coming uh, to to not bring arms I mean this again this is not a directive it's not um, you know it's not an order it's legal for people to bring arms but you know we've asked people to not counter protest, we can ask people to not bring arms as well. Um, so I'm gonna throw that that in there as well into the um, into the last whereas and I can come up with some language. I, I think I have some language I just need to like pop over and grab it. Um, uh, Lauren. Yeah, that, that was the one thing that stuck out to me. Um, so I like that addition. I mean, it seems like some language around tied to that, you know, remain peaceful and unarmed, however you can word it. But, you know, protesting is all of our right, but bringing violence is not our right. So however, however you can magically word that if you've got a proposal. <laughs> With that sentiment. Yeah. Dan, go ahead. I was just going to say may, maybe something along the lines of, um, you know, a peaceable protest. Um, th there's no, uh, there's neither need nor necessity for being armed at a peaceable protest, and we strongly encourage any anyone to anyone coming for either protest or count, you know. Uh, to any of these events to do so without firearms. Sorry, that was awkwardly worried. I, like I, eh, I think it was fine. It gets it. Um, but the I sentiment. Think, yeah, I think tying it tying it with the peaceable protest language, yeah. I think may 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 strengthen it um, a little bit, and it's the idea that. You know, we're certainly not discouraging. I mean, we're not just we're not saying they can't protest because they can, um, but but simply strongly discouraging and firearms. Yeah, um, Donna, go ahead. 
I was thinking, Dan, could you put it like, please come to peacefully protest unarmed? Or please come <laughs> unarmed to peacefully protest? You know, just like a simple sentence instead of a much longer sentence that you started with? <laughs> Well, I, I just don't think we want to say the words, please come in a resolution that's saying, oh. please don't come. Um, <laughs> Read out what I just wrote out of that. Without arms. Okay. Yeah. Um, Cameron, do you have, you wrote some of that down? I did. So your last whereas, I ended it with, in addition, so after it says we're asking you to consider safety first during these events, in addition, there is neither need nor necessity to be armed at a peaceful protest and anyone coming to any of these events, please do so without firearms. I like that. Yeah. Very yeah. well done. Yeah, and again, acknowledging, well, you know, at least in this space, wanna acknowledge that like, it is legal for people to, um, to bring firearms, we can we can always ask them not to. So, um, okay. Any any other thoughts, uh, Connor? Go ahead. Yeah, no. I just want to thank you, Mayor, for getting out ahead of this. And I think it's important to say that this is probably counterintuitive to a lot of us who come from like activist backgrounds to discourage people to go out and do a counter protest. But I think like as important as this resolution is just let's be explicit, like. Like everybody's well-intentioned who's putting this Facebook group together, uh, but I really worry about it. You know, let's let's call it what it is. The, the president is inciting domestic terrorism. A lot of the people who are showing up on Sunday are listening to him. They're going to be there. They're going to be armed. They're going to be angry. So to advertise, I think I think they backed off on this. It was initially a family-friendly protest. Um, I think you got to be really careful here. You can't be bringing kids to this or somebody could really get hurt. So um, again, I respect all the people who are putting this Facebook group out, um, but, but just pay attention. It's not more courageous showing up. You, the, like the mayor said, there's other ways to protest this. Uh, don't put yourselves in jeopardy. Don't put our police, other people trying to de-escalate it in jeopardy. Just please stay home. It's... Um, Chief, I see that you have turned your video on. Did you want to ad address any of this? If not, that's okay. But. I, I could I could do it quickly, and, and, I, and I, I, I think, um, especially the members of the council, um, Bill and Cameron, uh, for, their, for your guidance, your leadership, uh, as we're dealing with this, with this situation. And, um, and, and ultimately, we, we in Montpelier Police Department, we value um, everyone's rights, their constitutional rights for speech and for assembly. But uh, in, in echoing, uh, 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 Council Member Casey, we also want to make sure and ensure the safety, and 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 uh, and, and we want to. While we don't know of any direct threats to Montpelier, uh, to the Capitol, um, nor do we have any information as how many people may or may not show up, but uh, we we want to be able to focus our resources directly where they may need to be. And, and looking at the national trends and looking at open at, at what's on the news, um, we, we just want to be able to, to ensure that the best way for us to ensure everyone's safety is just to advise folks, uh, just to exercise caution and discretion uh, in, in what they're doing going forward. So again, thank you all very much for your support and for this opportunity and for your leadership as we move forward and uh, overcoming this because we are going to overcome this and we are going to ensure the safety of our city and of our community. Thank you, Chief. And uh, I also just want to thank you uh, personally, myself. Uh, thank you for all the work that you and your staff are doing uh, to 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 ensure our safety um, coming up. We uh, deeply appreciate it. Um, so please pass that on um, from us. Okay. Um, so, uh, any other changes to this resolution? Okay, um, is there a motion? I move we adopt it. I'll second. Okay. okay, we got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? Okay, um, thank you all. Um, Lauren, go ahead. 
Does, is it clear that it's as amended with that? Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. As amended, yes. Right. Yes. Okay. That's also how I understood it. Thank you for that clarification. Okay. Um, all right. Great. Um, so moving on, we have um, uh, an warning for the net zero plan. Um, I sort of assume either uh, Bill or Cameron is talking about this. Or maybe Donna. Donna, maybe. At one point, I had thought this was in the consent agenda. I thought it was on the consent agenda last week, to be honest with you. Well, I, I agree, but. It was. Um, it was. We talked about it. I pulled it out and talked about it. That's what I thought, too. I was surprised when I saw it tonight, honestly. I, mean, I didn't pull it out, but I talked about it after we passed the consent about. agenda. Cameron, you muted. Cameron, you muted. Sorry, I'm five, five layers deep here. I, I think this is, a, I'm looking at it, and it has a January 6th date on it. I think it just got carried over from last time. Yep. We apologize for that. Okay. That's all right. Okay. Um, yeah, go ahead. Is Cameron going to send us a clean copy of the resolution? Has passed. I'm working on that as we speak. Which oh, is yeah, I'm so impressed. Thank you. Thank you. Things deep. Sorry. That would be great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, all right. So, a uh, potential ballot item uh, retail cannabis. Um, I know this is um, something that Councillor Casey has been working on. So, I think I may turn it over to him. Yeah, sure. And I, I've spoken about it at a couple other meetings. Um, this was uh, something I've had a, a few constituents come up to me um, and ask for us to consider putting it on the ballot. Um, city staff did a great job with the synopsis uh, that's included in the packet here, uh, but it does stem from S54, uh, which was passed in the legislature, um, and the legalization um, and regulation bill uh, does require that a municipality pass on Australian ballot language um, allowing for uh, the sale of retail uh, cannabis. Um, th this wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to set up a shop until I think it's um, later in 2022, uh, but about 10 towns have adopted this already for the ballot. And I, I think there's good reason to. Um, I, I think we want voters really to consider two things. First, what we'd be putting in front of them now, do you want it or do you not? Um, Personally, I see some benefits in having um, retail cannabis in Montpelier, certainly revenue. Uh, we could go on about how the war on drugs has failed. Uh, but certainly we've had a dispensary here, a medical dispensary for the last seven years, um, who have been really good partners with the city um, in an area of town that I, I think has not been very disruptive at all. So I, I think we wanna make the determination early in this process. Um, do we want retail cannabis? Um, if we don't, that's okay. I, I have no desire to introduce it a second time. But if we do, um, let's go through the motions of doing it right. Let's make it transparent. Let's have a community process on it and say, what does that look like in our community? Because um, I, I, I see potential in rushing it if we wait another year to put it on the town meeting day ballot there. Uh, so I think this sparks a discussion. Um, you know, honestly, I think our community has been pretty progressive on this issue about 10 years ago, passing a resolution to decriminalize marijuana. Um, and there, there certainly are some benefits to having a dispensary in town there. And, and being one of the first, I think, encourages early investment in this um, and allows us to have all the information we need to make an intelligent decision. Um, I, uh, again, I'm not an expert on this. Uh, you'll see a little square uh, with Virginia Renfro. Uh, who has, she does represent the dispensaries. She's been in the state house working on this issue. Um, so if there were any more like technical questions or anything anybody had, um, I just asked Virginia to be here because she might know the answer to it. Uh, but basically that's my spiel. I think it deserves its stay in court. And um, again, without expressing a serious like, you know, uh, side one way or the other on this, I think it makes sense for the council to put on the ballot, uh, have some discussions before March maybe let people make the case and it goes up or down. So that's it for me. Thank you. Uh, comments or questions? Uh, Jack and then Dan. 
I agree with this. I think we should do this. Uh, from everything I've been told, there are large segments of the population who enjoy uh, partaking in uh, marijuana usage. And uh, I understand it's uh, quite pleasurable for those who do. Um, I think it's an opportunity to treat uh, the adults in the community as adults. And um, I think legalization is long overdue. And now that we're there, I think that uh, this is has potential for our for the city, and I think we should uh, be doing it. Uh, Dan, I I won't ask where Jack gets his information from, um, <laughs> but given his Grateful Dead playlist on uh, Facebook, I don't know if I want to know. Um, but uh, Chief. One of the components of this is uh, uh, has a sort of public safety component, of especially driving impaired, and it talks about um, training to be received by police departments and, and dealing with that. Um, do you have any concerns about about the timing of this or your ability to um, address those issues? Uh, that's a very good question, uh, sir. I, I, at the moment, I don't think that there is. There, there is established uh, practice regarding how to make the determination of, of impaired driving um, with it, other than the standard things that we use for DUI, which will require things like, you know, blood draws and, and, and things to that effect, but in how to, to determine that. Um, and this is a case that nationwide, uh, the legislation is moving faster than, than a law enforcement reaction. So that's something that we would definitely have to continue to consult with, with Commissioner Sterling's office and, and look for those best practice ways to, to include the, the academy. One thing I, I would caution uh, with uh, is just to, to look at ways that uh, what I've seen in other places uh, what, in my previous assignment uh, when um, uh, marijuana was, was legalized, uh, we always saw um, burglaries and robberies at dispensaries. Uh, so so uh, I, I would just say that we, uh, to, to just make sure that we're looking at um, security practices uh, for folks who are in town who may be uh, uh, involved in distribution or, or selling. Um, so just, just to make sure that, that, that they're, they're protected, um, their business is protected, uh, and then it helps us in our response efforts if we have to, uh, to respond again to a, to a potential break. I, I've also see, I've also seen those reports about the uh, significant increase in uh, Girl Scout cookie sales across the street from said dispensaries. Um, okay, uh, but you know, so just to understand, I mean, it, as reading the the um, documents that we were handed, it's it sounds like towards the end of this year there'll be the state is aiming to get training out. To police departments for that, um, and you know, it seems to be one of these things where there'll be a training about the same time the dispensaries open. And I just wanted to make sure that there wasn't any sort of larger concerns. I mean, sometimes these things do move fast, and obviously you have to play a little bit of catch up. But I just wanted to make sure there wasn't any particular outstanding concern uh, from a public safety point of view of that. Uh, to my knowledge, no, and I would have to, I, I, while I wasn't here during that initial conversation as the, the legalization process was going through, uh, I've got a, a tremendous amount of faith in uh, Commissioner Sherling and his ability to look ahead. And so I, I have no doubt that there are, this is something that he and the Academy are working on. Yeah. Thanks. I, you, you know, I, I guess I'll just echo, I, I, don't, I don't have a problem with this being put on the ballot, having voters uh, being asked and, um, while I might be less familiar than, than other members of the community with these uh, practices, I certainly uh, understand that they are um, widespread. Thank you. Um, Jay and then Lauren. Well, I, I just wanted to follow up and I think actually to Dan's point that, um, and supporting Connor's argument here that uh, getting ahead of it, getting, getting it on the ballot now so that we are in a, like, we, we can start this process early and don't have to feel like we're in a position where we're rushing to um, be able to sort of catch up and, and um, you know, manage that whole process on a short, 
time frame, I think it makes it, I, I, I fully support the idea of getting on the ballot early so that we can work through all this process ahead of time. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Lauren. Um, yeah, I, I agree as well. I think, you know, hearing the will of the voters now and then having lots of time to plan uh, makes a lot of sense. I just had one question. It might be for Virginia. Just if, if people were wondering how this would roll out and it might not be clear yet as this is getting going, would it be like the way people get liquor licenses now? Is that the kind of role the city would play potentially um, as operations were getting up and running? Or is, is there any sense of that yet or is it too early? So, um, so Virginia Renfrew, I work with the medical cannabis dispensaries. Um, so there'll be a cannabis control board, which will be established um, hopefully over the next couple of months. And so they'll start to really kind of lay out what this is going to look like. And I know that when the uh, dispensaries, <clears throat> the, when that law first passed, they all had to go, if they wanted to be like in Montpelier, the dispensary had to come to Montpelier City Council and get the approval of actually being there. So I'm envisioning that that will probably be one of the uh, requests on the application that the Cannabis Control Board will be putting out. So different people will apply, but they would have to, if they were gonna, you know, wanted to open up a retail store in Montpelier, on that application, it would probably ask, has the town or city approved your um, uh, your store and have you gone through zoning? Thanks. Uh, Donna, go ahead. Uh, Virginia, nice seeing you again. Uh, do you get samples? <laughs> um, I was just reading the language about the local cannabis control commission. And it's like the liquor board, if I understand this right, it's set up and then we no longer govern it. It's independent, is that correct? Well, uh, and actually in uh, Act 164, it does allow each municipality to have their own um, kind of cannabis commission if they choose to have a retail store. And um, if you have a local tax, which I think is 1%, um, if you have that in place right now, then you can uh, apply that to the cannabis retail store. My understanding, if, you, if you're a town who doesn't have that, you can't put it in after the store comes in. But then the Cannabis Control Board will also be looking at local fees of what uh, cities and towns can charge for different fees to these um, to these businesses, but the only the only request by the legislature for uh, city and town voter approval is for the cannabis stores. So there'll be you know small growers, there'll be um, uh, wholesale, but none of that has to go through what the cannabis retail stores have to go through as far as being approved by the voters. I was just trying to understand the relationship. I mean, it says the municipals set it up, but that it sort of indicates that, that then the municipals wait for the board to present the rules. And so I guess how much of this language stays that way should this pass? Do we get to muck around in it <laughs> if, it should if it should pass? you know, th these rules? Well, I mean, I think that you would have the ability to certainly make the decision, you know, let's say somebody wanted to, you know, and I, I'm not sure what the city of Montpelier wants to do, but let's just say that somebody says, well, I want to put my retail store um, at where the former Bluestone was in Montpelier is like, mm, I don't think that's necessarily, I think that you will have say in where it can be within your city uh, you know, lines. Um, and I mean, there's, there is some unknowns right now because we don't have this cannabis control board and they will be putting together rules, but okay. certainly you'll have the opportunity to um, go in front of this cannabis co control board while they're making their rules and regulations to say, you know, this is what we feel as a, as a municipality that we would like to see um, you know, our, our ability to have some control over this. And so I believe that that certainly, uh, I know the city and 
League of Cities and Towns was very active in Act 164. Thank you, thank you. I definitely support moving this direction. I think marijuana needs to be treated like liquor. The more we do that, the better. So thank you. Um, so I have a question and a comment. Um, so just to clarify one of the things that you uh, said, Virginia, um, my understanding was that there was not an opportunity for a municipality to um, have a local option tax on the retail sale of cannabis. Uh, but is that, uh, is that not the case? Do you already have a 1%? We have uh, meals, rooms, and alcohol, but not sales. So I assume it does not, it would, it would apply if, it, if we had a sales, 1% sales tax, but not, it's not going to be lumped in with the like meals, rooms, and alcohol and cannabis. Well, there's going to be a 20% tax on the can, I think 16% tax, maybe 16% uh, sales tax on uh, cannabis. And <clears throat> let me get back to you, uh, Mayor, on that, because my understanding is that if, so I know like um, uh, Williston, who has a tax on all of the stores that they have up there, I think they have a 1%, then if somebody was to open one there, that would continue to happen. Um, and so, um, but I, I can get you some more information on that. Thank you. I am sort of assuming that it's the sales tax as opposed to meals, rooms, and alcohol. And for some reason I thought, well, it could, is it, is it? It's a, called a local, a local, local tax, option, local option tax. So you, Montpelier doesn't have that. We don't have a local option sales tax. We have a local option meals, rooms, and alcohol tax. Hmm. All right. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll get back to you on that. Okay. Thank you. Um, the second thing, um, I agree with the sentiment that as much as we can, treating cannabis like alcohol, I think makes sense. One of the things that I wanna be wary of is especially as we have a community conversation around this leading up to uh, town meeting day, um, my, one of the things that I, I'm concerned about is underage usage and just think, wanting to think ahead about how, how are we um, working to, to minimize that. I mean, I know it's already um, relatively prevalent among youth in uh, our community. And I, I think that is something that needs to be addressed. And to be fair, this is more, um, in the realm of the schools, but I would be uh, interested in, uh, pot in potentially the school's comments as well as, um, as well as their plan for, you know, what to do if or when um, usage changes, um, or particularly increases. A anyway, all that is also to say, I'll be very interested to see the youth behavior risk survey data um, over the next few years, if this does go through. Um, and if yes, I could just ahead. add, um, there's a certain percentage of the money that is going to be collected through the taxes that is gonna go specifically for prevention. And it will be mm -hmm. going out to the schools to work um, around prevention. So, um, and that, that was something that was definitely, um, you know, really, um, desired strongly by legislators to ensure that uh, as we open up uh, the cannabis retail stores, <clears throat> which is for, you know, someone who's over 21, but that some of that money be uh, given to prevention programs. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Uh, Donna. Well, I'd like to make a motion to direct staff to add the article about cannabis to the ballot warning. To present this. Actually, um, I mean, that's fine. You actually are the people that decide what goes on the warning. We, we can write it down, but it's the council what? votes to put things on the warning. Right. Well, that's what I'm asking for, to vote on it. That's what your directive says, is that you need us to give you direction and you have ballot language here. So I'm accepting- I I'd just say, frame your motion to, to add that ballot language to the warning. That's all. That's Don't just tell us to do it. You can actually, you need to do it. So 
All right, because your recommended action was to give direction to city staff, but I'll, I'll stop that. I'll just put a motion out there that we put, shall the city of Montpelier permit the operation of cannabis retailers and integrated licensees, which are licensed by the state of Vermont pursuant to Act 164 of 2020, subject to the such municipal ordinance and regulation as the city council may lawfully adopt and implement. Second. Thank you. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay. So that motion passes. So that'll the item will be on the ballot. Uh, okay. So the next item is about uh, uh, the clerk's lawsuit. Um, so for this, John, thank you. All. I'll be I'll be really quick because um, I know that there's a lot going on, and this is kind of a favor I'm asking. I don't know if you all are aware of this. I, it was in the paper again today that there's a, a, a title insurance company that's based out of Connecticut, but their 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 Vermont company, their Vermont uh, director is technically the plaintiff that are targeting eight clerks' offices. I'm not one. Uh, of just sort of randomly, you know, Whiting, Milton, South Burlington, Plainfield, Northfield, um, to force them to basically go back to pre-COVID access rules in terms of hours and, and you know, not making appointments, just having the doors open. So obviously it's dangerous, obviously it's stupid, obviously it goes in, in contradiction to the governor's order. So if this were to be approved, then it would bring into question the governor's order the language of it would bring into question, um, even after the, the COVID situation, uh, whether town municipal offices across the state can even have different hours at all, because it's about equality of access. So anyways, it's dangerous, it's ridiculous. They have a motion for uh, an expedited hearing and, and uh, that is being heard at the end of next week. I've already gotten a letter signed by more than 200 clerks and treasurers across New England and in New York um, that I sent their way, you know, deploring this. And um, it would just be, since it is something that would infect, infect, <laughs> oh, that's a Freudian slip, affect, you know, entire municipal buildings and then presumably towns, if you started a cluster at City Hall, uh, I just love some backup. You know, if you all, I didn't want to craft a you know, a resolution that felt a little presumptuous, but, you know, if there were just a motion, you know, of the, of the sense of the council, um, you know, condemning this, this action, it would be, it would be helpful. I think I can, you know, I could talk to Cameron about getting, getting that out there. And it's just another, another person coming down on it. Yeah. Another entity. Yeah, go ahead. I, I agree. I reviewed the, uh, um, the complaint um, it's uh, one thing that was striking to note was that while the complaint uh, says that all these towns across the uh, state are violating the law uh, in a very, very vaguely uh, worded way, violating the law by not allowing uh, access to the land records, the, uh, the complaint does not uh, indicate a single person who has uh, attempted to gain access to the uh, land records of any town in the state and, and been denied or hindered or delayed in doing so. Um, I know that uh, a friend of mine is on the select board, also a lawyer and is on the select board on, in Bolton. And I know there's a, a motion to dismiss uh, for failures to state a claim on which relief can be granted that's been filed. And uh, <clears throat> I, I think that this is, uh, on, on its face, this is uh, in, invalid and Ill illegitimate uh, pursuit. And I certainly agree. I would move that it be that, that we express that it's a sense of the council to uh, oppose uh, the uh, the relief sought by this litigation 
although not by uh, devoting any uh, funds or other resources uh, to doing so. I second. Okay. Um, yes, Donna, go ahead. I, I just want to add to my second, Jack. I mean, you worded it well. I couldn't figure out why. I mean, they had no real plaintiff, no person who said they couldn't get records. I just found it very, I still don't understand why they're doing it. If anybody wants to understand, there's um, probably stuff I shouldn't say in open channel. Because okay, it's about I'll, the I'll come visit individual you. Individual people in my opinion of them. But um, one thing I, I will just also add, just, just for your all's information, the, the, the existence of this lawsuit, I know of two cases now, including one in this county, where it has been specifically weaponized to force clerks to open up hours against their uh, their their current procedures and policies. You know, one where it's just you know a, a lawyer comes in and says, "I want to get in now. You give me access now, or we'll put you on the lawsuit." It was, so is this like challenging an executive order? Is that the real basis of it? I think it's more. I think it's more narrow than that. I think okay. it's just uh, petulance. Yeah, I won't belabor it, but yeah. Uh, Dan, go ahead. Yeah, I, um, I mean, I'm familiar with this lawsuit. I, I, I guess part of my concern in sitting here and thinking about weighing in on the a lawsuit is as a town or as a city, I don't know if I'm fully comfortable with the precedent of doing that because you know, the, the strength of this argument will rise or fall in court. And, um, you know, I have, I know the attorneys that are arguing on both sides of this and, you know, I fully expect that, you know, the arguments that they're going to put forth on standing or failure to state a claim or um, in actual injury, all the preliminary injunction standards as well, you, you know, will get litigated. And, and I don't know, you know, if the intent of the motion is to, I mean, we're not a party to this litigation. Um, and I, I would think if, if, for example, you know, there was a lawsuit, um, you know, involving some other piece of, of action that didn't directly involve us, we start weighing in, you know, like, for example, um, you know, all the federal lawsuits about the election, you know, we may have personal feelings about it, but I guess I'm a little bit trepidatious about starting to you um, take sort of formal city resolutions or, or positions on lawsuits that don't involve us. Um, if the resolution is intended really sort of as an expression of support or solidarity for clerks and the governor's resolution. Um, I guess I'm more comfortable with that. Um, it, it, but my concern is, you, you know, I just think, for example, if, if, a, if a city in, say, Alabama had said, we want to take a position against all the litigation, um, the recount litigation, I think we would have a, a problem with that, um, uh, particularly because it didn't involve them, as this doesn't necessarily directly involve us. If we're trying to articulate a position of support for um, general, maybe that's much more comfortable. I'm starting to repeat myself. I apologize. Um, I think that's my my concern, and I'll stop right there for the time being. Can I respond to that really briefly? Yeah. Um, it does directly involve the city, because this is this is a, a would be a, a a blanket decision to open clerk's offices, which exist in municipal buildings, in city halls, town halls. It would force us to change our policies for access, not just to my office, but to the city hall building. So that is that is an act of, of policy separate from the clerk's office. It has to do with the actual physical building and the safety of uh, you know what has been decided by the city is it are appropriate moves in the interests of safety of the municipal, not just the municipal employees, but the greater city at large. Um, it it wouldn't just mean I I open up a ladder, open up my window and put a ladder out the door. It means we unlock city hall. It's no, I, group. it directly I, affects us, and that is in fact the point. They're not just going after these eight clerks' offices. This is something they want to to 
to get through to have a blanket effect on all the municipalities in Vermont. And I think all the municipalities in Vermont therefore have a direct interest in this in this lawsuit and I, I don't think it's anything as abstract as you know somebody in Alabama not liking the election this is about this is about us this is about city of Montpelier and how we get to run our affairs in the interests of safety it, it's a it's a shot not not off to the side that's not oblique it's a broadside right at that I don't I mean I I don't necessarily uh, agree um, that that would that would follow. I mean, I understand where you're going with that, John, and I'm not, and I'm not trying to be. Um, I, I guess I'm expressing a oh, uh, a note of caution here, and um, you know, I have I'm not familiar with the legal arguments that they're making, and so if I understand you correctly, John, you're saying that, you know, they're attacking the sort of underpinnings of every clerk that's closing um, and such that if they were to prevail, I mean, cause it's, a, it's, a, it's the rule of, of litigation is that, you know, the decision only affects the parties that are, that have standing and have an opportunity to um, respond that are named in the caption, you know, as opposed to being affected. But what you're saying is, is that once the, you know, if a decision was put out there by a superior court judge and said it's unconstitutional or um, uh, whatever arguments are raising then, and if they were successful, then it's just a matter of time before our regulations would fall or, you know, they'd be susceptible to a challenge where we'd have to rethink that. And I guess along those lines, I mean, is there an effort then by municipalities, either by the league of cities and towns or by, you know, some clerks association to gain standing uh, as an interested party? In, in I'm, not, I'm not sure, but I just... Another thing to respond to, these eight municipalities, they are random, okay? Right. This, is, this was not that there were particular issues with these towns. In fact, one of them has more of the most open policies I think of anyone in state and all these municipalities are baffled. They don't know who's, who's bringing this, but its intent is to, to create uniform access. Um, I mean, that is written in there, so. It, I mean, it is explicitly about Vermont municipalities, and these are just, you know, the sort of, and I wouldn't say random, there's an attempt to sort of get a broad swath of types of municipalities and types of access. You know, you get Whiting in there, and you get Milton in there, or you get Northfield right. in there, and you get South Burlington in there. Um, but, you know, I think the intent is clear. It's not, it's not a lawsuit about Whiting and South Burlington and Plainfield and Northfield and Milton. I don't okay. think there's any. I don't think that's being hidden. I don't think that's subtext. Right. No. I, I I gather that, and I guess the other, you know, the other, um, you know, if if we pass this, I mean, what what effect does it have other than just sort of publicly stating that we we support the defense of this or oppose the as a general principle? I mean, is there an intent to then take action on this, seek interested party status? Um, I think speaking out is, is you know, I have no intent when I circulated that letter and sent a letter of 200, you know, clerks from across the region, we're not looking for status. We're not looking for anything other than this is our voice, hear it. And right. I think there's inherent value in that. Yeah, I mean, uh, sorry, Jack, and I know you're, <laughs> and I just want to sort of trace this down is that, um, you know, I, I, I understand there's a certain, public principle behind that. But, you know, I'm wondering if, if this is talking about, is this something where, you know, and it would make sense to have, have these sort of unified voices say it. I mean, I presume that the, the attorneys are going to reach out to the clerks to be able to testify that this is a bigger issue than, than just these eight towns. But I mean, that to me would be much more effective to um, to be able to make those arguments to the judge who would ultimately be the decision maker on that. You know, impeachment is more effective at getting rid of Trump than my speaking out. But I don't think that precludes my speaking out, nor, nor do I think it really, frankly, gets me off the hook for it. I think, um, you know, you just got to 
if there's something you, you don't believe, I mean, if nothing else, it affects the cost benefit analysis for going, they decide at some point they're, they're sowing more ill will than it's worth. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it matters and you don't have to pick one, you know, it doesn't have to be a lawsuit or a public statement or party in a, in a hearing or a demonstration, you know, that's, you know, it's, it's, it's about, you know, speak out for what's right or not, you know. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, li a little bit different and, and I guess I, I still have this at, at the end of the day and this may be more of a a litigator or attorney's response, which is, you know, um, fearful about weighing in on 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 this type of of litigation. But I, uh, I think I've made that point. Um, sorry. I... Okay. Um, before I go back to Jack, anyone who hasn't spoken about this topic um, want to weigh in? Okay, uh, Jack, go ahead. Thank you. Um, while this exchange was going on, I, uh, I did a little typing uh, to try to address Dan's concerns. And let me read you what I wrote to see if this might be uh, something that would be more acceptable and potentially get uh, a unanimous uh, vote in favor of it. It is, and so this isn't an amendment yet, but if, uh, if it looks like it flies, I would move to amend the, my previous motion to, to word it this way. It is the sense of the council that the limits on access to the Montpelier land records adopted by the Montpelier city clerk are reasonable and reasonably targeted to protect the public health and safety while maintaining reasonable access to public documents. Consequently, the Montpelier city council supports the municipalities who are opposing the action now pending as Connecticut, Connecticut Attorney's Title Insurance Company versus Town of Bolton et al. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I think that's more comfortable. I mean, if we want to even insert uh, language that uh, the uh, actions we believe are fully compliant with the governor's powers um, under public health statutes. I think that's, that's perfect. I, I think I like that phrasing better, Jack. I think that answers thank, my concerns. Thank you. Um, let me, let me type something else in. Um, what I'm typing in is, and in conformity with Vermont law and the governor's executive order. Now I kind of lost whether or not we had a motion in a second already. We did, did we? yeah. We did. And so I move that we, I move to amend the motion that I uh, that I made to uh, strike it all and put this uh, language in instead. And let me, I'll re happily read it again if you'd like me to. Uh, I think that would probably be fine. good just to have it all together. Okay. Sorry, go ahead, Donna. What? I'm just going to say the second is fine with the amendment. But... Okay. Council Wait. Member Jack, do you mind emailing it to us? Oh, I certainly would. Thank uh, you. Would not mind it, mind doing that. I would happily do that. Um, it is the sense of the council that the limits on access to the Montpelier land records adopted by the Montpelier city clerk are reasonable and reasonably targeted to protect the public health and safety while maintaining reasonable access to public documents and in conformity with Vermont law and the governor's executive order. Consequently, Montpelier City Council supports the municipalities who are opposing the action now pending as Connecticut Attorney's Title Insurance Company versus Town of Bolton et al. Okay. Uh, all right. So. Uh, there's a motion and a second, which is this uh, amendment. Um, any further discussion on on this? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? 
Okay, so that motion is amended. Now we got to vote on the motion. Um, so all in favor of, oh, I'm sorry, any further discussion about the motion? Yeah, I'll just maybe a final thing. I mean, because I do, we, our firm does a fair amount of title work and land transactions. And so I think substantively underlying this, I, I, I want to say that I think, you know, this is, this is the right, ultimately the right position. And if I was, our, you know, because we have been able to do closing after closing, it's slower, it's a little bit more difficult, but so is everything in COVID. Um, and, you know, so I, this, this, I certainly agree with the substance of this posi pos position as well. And that's been my experience as a, as a title attorney is it hasn't stopped people from buying homes or selling them. Mm. And I just emailed that to John and Cameron. Okay. Thank you. Okay, any further discussion? Okay. okay. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, so that motion passes. Thank you. Thank and you all. It does make a difference. That, uh, suit Thanks goes the right way. Yeah. Okay, uh, we are up to the last item of our regular business, which is uh, the warning uh, for the town meeting. Um, so you have a draft yeah. in your packet you've just added an article 15 for, regarding the cannabis unless you want to move it to some other location i will note that i caught um, under article one obviously we draft these from one year to the other and there is a line in article one that says one council member from district three to fill out the remainder of a term of two years uh, to expire in one year and that is not so that should be struck that was for last year um, Otherwise, the, um, the, the numbers for the city budgets are all correct. We don't have all the final school numbers yet to put in. Just a couple things about that, if I may. There's a couple things, and, and sorry, I missed that. That was basically a placeholder because I hadn't heard back from, you know, who was going to run for you know, how many positions they needed in cemetery parks, blah, blah, blah. Um, but also the school and the CVPSA lines in there, they actually ultimately need to come from those respective clerks or organizations to go into the final. So those are essentially placeholders um, until until next time on the final the final hearing. And, and you don't actually final approval of the warning until next meeting, which when you actually vote what goes on the ballot. So this is a first public hearing if anybody has any questions about anything that's on the ballot. So does that mean we should open the public hearing? I thought the mayor already did. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll officially do that right now. <laughs> public public uh, hearing is open on the warning. So we don't actually need to vote on this tonight. It's just a hearing. Okay. Um, do you have anybody I, else have questions or want to discuss anything on it? Can you explain why um, some of it is highlighted in yellow? So that's what uh, John Odom was just talking about. Those three uh, items need to come from the clerks of those agencies. So there are draft of them, but really until we get something official from the school district and CVPSA, this, this is unofficial. It's always last okay. minute. Uh, uh, Donna and then Lauren, go ahead. Um, but the actual at large comes from the person. And so since they're not doing peti pet petitions to be a candidate, or is that person just coming in and telling you, John? No, no, that's not how this works. This is just, the warning says you're going to be electing one at-large person. Just like it says you're going to elect one council member from each district. That's what the, the warning says. Then the actual ballot will have the names of the people. That All right, but it, it, it may be a placeholder that won't be filled if we don't have somebody who wants to be there. That's all. Still has to be on the ballot, even if okay. there's nobody running. Okay. Yeah, it would just be your only potential to do anything would be to write somebody in. It would just be blank. Okay. Thank you. Oh, Lauren, go ahead. Uh, just had noticed in the nitpicky vein, um, there's in um, articles 
5, 9, 10, and 13, it talks about fiscal year 2020 to 22, and I think it's supposed to be 2021 to 22. It looks like it's like two years right now or a year and a half. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, who else? Okay. Any other comments from the public or anyone? Uh, Jack, go ahead. I, I assume I know the answer to this. There's the, uh, for articles uh, eight and nine for the payment to the uh, mayor and council, there's the $80 and $40 uh, extra. And that is that because of the same, the extra pay period, just like with the other personnel. Okay. Okay. Else? <laughs> Don't spend it all in one place. <laughs> okay. All right. So with that, I'm going to close the public hearing on that, and we will have the opportunity to vote on that next time. <clears throat> so, all right. So that is the end of our regular business. So we're up to council reports. Uh, Donna, go ahead. Um, yes, I sent everyone out a, a link to New York Times. I'm really sorry if you weren't able to open it. I'll be glad to send you the article if you like about New York looking at empty commercial spaces and make it looking at options for housing. And I wanted, I've been walking by these state buildings that are mostly empty and thinking about why not have housing, especially like that ugly building of the Department of Labor. Um, but I also got talking to people and thinking, well, Vermont College has dorm rooms that are empty. Heaton has a dormitory from the old hospital that maybe some of you don't know. On Heaton Street, there's now a uh, senior housing on one side, but the other side, that dormitory was turned into offices by Washington County Mental Health. But it was fixed for housing. So there are lots of buildings like that. And so I'm just trying to get some stakeholders together and get the council to think about these kinds of creative ideas for housing that we should put the money in instead of some temporary building or portable classroom or a shelter. Um, so I'm going to be bringing some information at our next meeting from and trying to get some stakeholders to talk about this idea. So I'm just giving you a heads up. And I'm open to ideas and people you want to be part of the discussion. It's like a Zoom roundtable. Thank you. You might want to come to the uh, to a housing task force meeting to talk about that too. Okay, great. That's what I want. Names. All right. Send me. Yes. All right. Housing task force. I'll send you a note about that. Yeah. Good. Sam has already talked to some people, and uh, so Rick's really interested. Yep. Okay, uh, Connor. Now that was a great article, Donna, in the, the Times there. Definitely would encourage everybody to read that. Um, I think I, I'm all good. I would just encourage people again to download the My Ride app. It's so cool. Uh, you know, been using it hypothetically if you got a boot on your car and you needed to get a ride back home to get money and then go to the police department, My Ride could do something like that. I'm not saying that happened, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's really good and it's. Uh, you know, I, I think we're, we're seeing the bumps in the road on it too, uh, but it's kind of a good period to do that before like state employees come back and everything. I think there is a time to catch a breath on this and, and do it right. So download my ride. Cheers. Well, Connor, I can tell you, I, I tried to use it this week and um, they told me it was full. There were no seats left. That's and a so good problem to, to have, I think now, yeah. yeah. And so I had to, I had to uh, log in later. I actually think that that might have been, they, they were having an issue with that where it was sending people that message. So that might've been a glitch that has since been resolved. So keep that in mind. I was hoping it was successful. Yeah, right. <laughs> that would be a great problem. Um, okay, uh, Jay. All right, thanks. So this is probably like uh, the best council report I could ever give or that my most favorite of all time is gonna be hard to top because um, I get to do two things. One, I get to brag about 
uh, my amazing wife and two, I get to share some amazing news for the city. Um, uh, a few meetings ago, we heard from, uh, from Kevin Casey and from Vermont River Conservancy about their interest in pursuing a grant with the LWCF, the Land Water Conservation Fund. Um, and we gave them the go ahead and they did that. Uh, it, it, you know, it'll involve some matching funds down the road, but, but they went ahead and VRC and Kevin and Alec, uh, they all worked hard on it, um, submitted it a week and a half ago. Ricarda, my wife with VRC presented to the grantors um, and they just found out a couple of days or a few days ago that they're fully funded for the grant proposal at $300,000. So wow. this is just the best news for the Confluence Park that we could have gotten. And I know there's still a lot of work to do in terms of design, in terms of uh, uh, getting the matching funds, but um, you know, I, I just uh, couldn't be more proud, you know, of, of VRC and Ricarda, but also excited for the city for this project and for the access that it'll create uh, to our river right downtown. So um, I'm just uh, super excited to be able to share that news tonight. Um, and they'll, you know, of course, they'll be um, uh, sharing it more br uh, broadly, you know, Kevin and Alec and, and, and VRC in the coming days, but happy to let everybody know that they were successful in that. So really good news. Yeah, that's wonderful. Uh, okay, Dan. So th three things real quick. Um, one is in the news recently, um, Vermont Law School has been sort of teasing the idea of moving to Burlington and, uh, you know, that may make some sense, but it would be really nice if we, um, we approached them to tell them that it was far more sensible to come to Montpelier or put programs here, given that we are the seat of government and um, that we would love to have them as part of our community. So I think it would be really nice to be able to approach them. And maybe it's not the city or maybe it's the MDC, maybe it's another entity, but I, I wanted to just simply raise that because if they're thinking at all about moving any part of their program, um, we should be pushing ourselves into the conversation if we're not already. Um, the other thing is, and it actually ties on to the idea of what John was talking about with uh, land transactions or what I said in reaction, which is there's a lot of new people moving to the area. Um, and uh, I think it would be, you know, it, there's an old fashioned idea of the welcome wagon, where when people come into the community, they get a basket of stuff and coupons to local businesses and introductions about the best place to get their oil changed. Um, and maybe this is a Montpelier or a live issue, but um, I just raised this as well. It just struck me that, you know, we should be doing outreaching to new members of the community um, and saying hello and welcome. Uh, and here's who we are. Um, and I guess finally, you know, this is maybe the old uh, the point that was made before, but I, I want to emphasize that I hope everyone stays safe over the next few days and stays um, in a place where, you know, we can avoid uh, situations as we saw last week in DC if, if in fact some of those things happen here. Um, because unlike lawful protests, the thing that happened in DC was not. Um, and no one wants to have either a discussion or a First Amendment argument when there's armed insurrectionists. And so uh, I hope everyone just simply stays safe and, and blogs about it at home. Uh, Jack. I agree with, the, I, I, don't, I don't have much. I agree with everything uh, Dan said. Um, at, at Vermont Legal Aid, we've uh, had interns from and from Vermont Law School, and we've hired many graduates of Vermont Law School, and we have some many many outstanding attorneys who who graduated from there. And we, I think, we would be an ideal location for for VLS to move. And if uh, Dan, if you if you wanted to be one of the people to approach the law school, I would certainly 
be part of that too, if you'd like. And because <clears throat> as I say, Vermont, Vermont Legal Aid has relied on VLS graduates to do, uh, to do some great work. Um, and the fact that we're right at the Capitol is, uh, is a great thing for a great opportunity for students. Um, and the only other thing I would say is uh, encourage people to stay home on Sunday. You know, we don't, we don't need to show up at the state house lawn to give voice to the fact that, uh, that the election's over and we won because we know it because uh, President Biden is going to be inaugurated next week. And I don't wanna see anybody get hurt. And that's all I've got. Thank you, um, Lauren. Yeah, thanks. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge it's a really sad day that for the first time in history, a US president was impeached for the second time by the US House like because of inciting a white supremacist, violent insurrection attack on our capital and democracy. And now seeing threats in our own community. And I'm just really appreciative of Chief Pete and the Montpelier Police Department Chief Gowans and our whole safety team in the community who are, I know, working incredibly hard to prepare as best they can to try to keep our community safe. So I just wanted to say thank you and echo to everyone to stay smart and safe over the coming week. And let's hope for the best and prepare and thank you all. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, I would just uh, add my own uh, thanks to all of you for your support and grace uh, through all of this. Um, you know, as we go through the next week or so, um, it's, it's really hard to know what is going to happen. Um, but I have faith that we are going to get through it. We're going to make it to uh, the 21st and um, I, I feel, I feel good that, that we are going to do our best to ensure that everyone is safe as best as we possibly can. Um, and yeah, anyway, I'm looking forward to the 21st. <laughs> uh, well, and, and, uh, and the inauguration. I also, you know, I was also sad just, uh, that we didn't really get a chance to, um, speaking for myself, um, really that we didn't get a chance to celebrate uh, the fact that the Senate um, is controlled by, by Democrats and that the election in Georgia went the way it did because it was overshadowed by um, everything that happened in, in the Capitol. Uh, in any case, and I, um, and I was grateful, uh, Dan, that you brought up uh, Eugene Goodman, who um, was uh, indeed a hero in saving um, lives at the Capitol uh, on that day. Um, beyond that, uh, last time I had, last council meeting I mentioned that I would be sending out to you uh, the city manager evaluation, which I did not do, but I almost sent it to you this afternoon and I am pretty much ready to click send on that. So um, that is coming very, very shortly. Um, in any case, um, grateful for, for all of you. Uh, certainly, let's be safe over the next uh, week. Uh, all right, uh, John, go ahead. Yeah, just probably one an election update. The uh, little emergency election bill uh, has now gone through both House and Senate GovOps. I think we're supposed to vote on it today, but I think they're voting on it tomorrow. I've sort of lost track of it. I've, I've been testifying in front of seven Senate GovOps a couple times the last week, but there's a lot going on. Um, the governor is going, there will be money provided for this. Uh, the money's kind of, you know, close your eyes, throw it against the wall. Nobody really knows how much communities are going to need for it, um, but it should be plenty. So it's going to cover everything that, you know, you, you all were concerned. I mean, it'll be a reimbursement situation. We'll just pay it out, but then we'll get refunded uh, or, you know, it'll, it'll come back. Uh, it also means I can spend a little more because this is just the closer we get, the more of a 
challenge, more of a mountain this looks like uh, to pull us off doing this all ourselves and turn it around in just a few weeks. So uh, knowing that money is there means that I can spend a little more, basically get some temporary help in to help out and we'll just make sure it works. Um, there is some talk that there was hubbub today that the governor might, you know, the executive order require communities to do it this way, to do the, the all mail in. Um, I think you won't see that. I think you'll see at least half of the communities not choose to do this, but we will. So I think we can be proud of that, assuming it all <laughs> works. <laughs> Cross your fingers. This is very scary right now. <laughs> uh, Bill. Yeah, thank you. I don't have a whole lot either. Um, I'd like to thank uh, our Montpelier Police Department uh, for all they do. But you know, this is tough times to be police. You know, we heard a lot of uh, constructive criticism tonight. A lot of concerns. There's been a lot of posting on front porch forum, and uh, I, I, I think those are all important questions that need to be asked and talked about. I, I will say that I, you know, it's our understanding that none of our officers participated, and I have uh, full confidence that our our people uh, will do the right thing and stand on the right side of the Constitution and the law if called to do so. And uh, they've got a tough, you know, I, I mean, we don't know what to expect, but there's. We're certainly spending a lot of time preparing for this weekend. So just, um, I'd like to, to say thank you to all of them. And I also was hoping that the chief could give us a brief update uh, about stuff that's coming up, or at least or if you have a chance to ask him any questions anyway, I'm putting him on the spot. I didn't warn him in advance, but uh, so chief, if there's anything you wanna to toss in here. Yes, sir, I'll be uh, as, as brief as, as, as possible and definitely answer any questions that the council may have of me. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to say that Again, reiterate that uh, we don't have any specific threats um, to Montpelier, to the state capitol, or to any of our elected officials, but we take this very seriously. I mean, I was right there watching this with, with the rest of the world, and, and I'm just as concerned, and we're looking at national trends, so we're taking this extremely seriously, and, 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 uh, and I couldn't be, and, and first, well, I also want to thank Bill and Cameron for their guidance and their leadership and how we're doing this. Um, uh, they're an instrumental role with us and especially with their support to the department. It means the world. Um, but uh, I gotta say that I, I, I couldn't be more proud of the men and women of this department and the sacrifices that they're making and the determination that they have and the grit that they're showing and ensuring that they, they want to uh, ensure the safety of, of our community. Um, uh, we are gonna continue our planning. We've been planning robustly with uh, agency partners, federal, state, municipal partners, to include uh, our surrounding agencies, Barry, uh, Barry Town, Barry City. Um, Hartford has even uh, reached out to us to see if there, there's anything that we need. So it's just been, it's just been great uh, to be here in, 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 in Vermont. Um, we, uh, we, we have sent information out, letting the, the folks uh, via the CAN network um, that uh, in the coming days, people may see Montpelier officers in ways that you haven't seen us before. Uh, that's because we have a heightened posture. And again, the, the, I wanna reiterate that we're taking this very seriously. So you may see officers um, that aren't with, our, with the tie and everything else like that. We may be wearing level four body armor on the outside. Um, level four body armor is designed to, to help us uh, against rounds from rifles and shotguns to so those effects. So again, that's the level of how we're taking this um, and how we're, we're being serious about this. Uh, also to let folks know or to let the council know that we have been coordinating closely with Montpelier Live and with the local businesses and merchants in the city. And uh, we're providing daily updates to them so they can prepare and plan for the safety of their businesses and their staff as well. So that's an ongoing continuous process. And again, we've also been working with um, uh, the community uh, action networks as well. Um, uh, on another note, we had a we had a had a had a meeting with with again our partners early today, and the the level of concern and tips that have been coming into the Vermont Intelligence Center to the state police is inspiring. So, uh, folks out here are diligent, and and it, which gives me faith and knowing that we're all going to make it through this, and and that we all understand uh, the safety behind this, and that Montpelierites are looking out for each other. Um, uh, and other than that. That's all I got. 
Thanks, Thank Chief. Um, I don't have anything else to report. Um, I think there's a couple of questions, uh, Dan and then Donna. Sure, uh, uh, Chief, I had a I had a question. You know, it seems like the timeline is is growing a little bit um, on this. Do you have any sense? Is this something where, you know, we're really looking at the 17th to the 20th, or is it starting sooner or or later? Do you have any sense as to, you know, what the activities are likely to be? Yes, sir. So, so from my understanding, um, it looks like that the reason that the 16th was one of the dates that um, that's being uh, that's out there within the media is because that's and that's a date of concern of, of 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 other areas, primarily in the U.S. Capitol. So, it looks like, in my opinion, out of an abundance of caution, the the bulletins are coming out for all agencies to be cognizant from the 16th through the 20th, um, especially. But uh, but the 17th and the 20th are the primary dates we're looking at, but we are again gonna increase posture, visibility, and, uh, and but moving after this, I, I think that, that we, we need to make sure we remain uh, um, vigilant beyond the 20th. It's not, as soon as the 20th is over with, we go back to business as normal. Uh, the, the department is, is going to make sure that we maintain a very robust uh, information sharing platform and working with our partners. Okay. Thank you, and and I'll echo the other counselors and mayor, and that thanks to the department and all the work you guys are doing because it's it's really wonderful. And please express that to the staff. Yes, sir. Thank you, Donna. Go ahead. Uh, yes, kudos to the police department. Yay, we're glad you're there. But I feel we would be amiss if we closed the meeting with Ralph recognizing that three of our counselors and announced their re-election runs. And I missed it, I'm sorry to say, so I'm making up for it now. <laughs> and maybe you all wanna say a word to your constituents on the TV that you're running for city council. Lauren, Jack, Dan, wanna say anything? Let's let Lauren go first. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. So yes, I'm running for re-election. Uh, paperwork should be arriving soon, John, in the mail. The postal service is <laughs> is, is uh, untapped. But yeah, no, would uh, would love to hear from people. Um, you know, as I as I run, of what your priorities are, and really hope to build on the work and in these really challenging times. Eager to kind of keep keep up the momentum for a lot of the projects we've been working on. So would love the chance. It's been a, an honor to serve and. Would love to be able to do it for another two years. Thanks. Either I feel the same. It's an honor to serve. I, I, uh, Montpelier. Everyone has heard me say this before. Montpelier is the best place in Vermont to live, and uh, and the work that uh, that we do here, uh, week in and week out, helps keep it that way. And. Uh, it's an honor to be able to be a part of that and uh, and to keep Montpelier being the uh, the great city that it is and I hope people will continue to support me on town meeting day. Um, I'm running for re-election as well and looking forward to actually serving in a, a full term as opposed to this one year experiment and hopefully this has proven fruitful for both myself and District 3. Uh, I've enjoyed it immensely. Uh, I'll echo Lauren and Jack's sentiments that that this is, uh, you know, I feel like I'm the luckiest guy to have the opportunity to serve, um, you know, with the staff, with the fellow counselors, with the mayor, Bill, Chief Pete. Um, but uh, it's also it's it's a great opportunity to um, to really make sure that everyone's voices and ideas are heard and and thoughtfully processed and so you know if there are constituent concerns and if anybody wishes um to give me any feedback or or thoughts i'm always open and always available and try and make those responses as thoughtful as i can whenever i receive emails so i hope for support as well uh i'd ask all of you to vote but i think only jay's the one can do that in reality so thank you Great. Mayor, I did have one more item. Okay. And that is, we don't want to forget to stay on to get our picture. 
Oh, right. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Thank you. I almost forgot. Yeah, I need to. All right. So, so council members and Cameron and John Odom, if he likes, could, if you could just stay on at the end here after we adjourn so we just get a group picture. And then Chief, I know you wanted to call Chief Pete. I know you wanted to call me, but uh, we need to do our photo up first here. Okay. Um, all right. Well, with that, uh, I'm going to adjourn the meeting. Clearly, like 10 o'clock came and went, and we were just still going. I think it's a good sign that people are like, no, let's keep talking. It's great. Um, we're cutting us off. We're done. Uh, right. So without um, objection, we're going to consider the meeting adjourned.